First thing I'm going to call for is a roll call. Robert Decker. Robert Decker. Here. Kathy Felton. Alex. Here. David Potter. David Potter. Unmute. Here. Okay, David. Bernard Sadowski here. Adam Sokolowski. Good evening, Bernie. You don't have to yell so loud. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, I Dave wasn't on, on, um, unmuted. And okay. John Sabersky. Okay. Review and vote on last minutes of meeting. Everyone have a chance to look them over? I haven't. Alex? Um, no, I don't. No. Short answer. David? Nope. No. Uh, do we we have a want to have a vote to accept the, the minutes, or we want to let that go by? Pass over it. Pass over it. So yep. we are not going to vote on the minutes of the last meeting. Correct. Let's mute it. Is that a? Let's take a vote on it. We're gonna we're gonna skip over the meeting, the uh, minutes. Okay. I, you want me to make a motion for you, Bernie? Make a motion, please. All right. You know. Uh, all right. I'll make a motion that we skip over voting and approving the minutes of the last meetings until later on this evening, or until we get a chance to read them. Okay. I haven't gotten them. Okay. Vote. Mr. Decker. We have a second. Uh, I second. Second. Yes. Vote. Yes. Uh, Mr. Decker. Yes. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. David. Yes. Myself. Yes. Adam Sokolowski. Oh, Sokolowski. Yes. Uh, yes. So we're not going to accept the meetings until we have a chance to read them. Okay, review mail. Has everyone had a chance to review mail? I have reviewed all the correspondence and mail provided. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Everyone has. David? Yes. Okay. All right, we're going to continue to uh, number six on our list, continuation of public hearing for applications of Daniel Talega for a special permit to use an accessory apartment at his home located at 127 North Main Street, map 158, lot, 20, 120, uh, lot 22. Mr. Chair? Yes? I wasn't present at their last hearing, but I did watch it on YouTube and did refer, uh, you know, read all the minutes in regards to this matter. Okay. Via the FCAT channel. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I think you took yourself out of this one. Is Kathy coming? No, she's not, but I'm gonna recuse myself. Okay. I check, I check with a lawyer and I can recuse myself. I can run the meeting since she's not here, but I cannot, I recuse myself from voting. Okay. So that all means right. For this vote, um, both alternates will be voting. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski, Mr. Decker. So you have a, but that means it has to be a unanimous decision to, uh, to go along with that. Now, because I'm recusing myself, you can withdraw, um, I believe, because there's not five, it's just gonna have be four, but that's up to you. Hi, Bernie. Sorry, we had. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So uh, it, fro it froze. It froze, and I had we had to log back in. So I apologize because we missed part of what you were saying. But we're looking to at this point because of some information that we've gathered. Instead of moving forward with it as an accessory apartment, we'd like to withdraw our application at this time, and then yes. we're going to file a new appeal. Okay. All right, so that means we have to accept your withdrawal, and I believe we have to vote on that. Well, we accept the 
the withdrawal of the application without prejudice. I'll right. second that motion, Mr. Decker. Okay. So we're going to take a vote. Remember now, uh, Patty, it's without prejudice. So we're not going to we're not going to hold anything against you. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Yep. Uh, vote uh, to accept their uh, withdrawal without prejudice. We had a second. Let's take the vote on that, please. Uh, Mr. Decker. Yes. Al Alex. Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm having some issues. <laughs> we can still uh, hear you very well, Alex. Okay, right. good. David Potter. Yes. And Adam Sekolowski. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Then what you'll do is uh, reappeal uh, or re yep. put up a new request. Yep. Okay. That's good. Uh, I think we're done with that, gentlemen. This is this is an odd situation with this headphone stuff. <laughs> well, Bernie, I can come to your computer and I can put you on, take you put you on speakers. Yeah, it's that? it's cut. It's kind of hard not being able to hear myself speak and listen at the right. same time. Okay, hold on. We're all set. <laughs> We're all so set, Bernie. We accepted that vote uh, four to zero. Yeah. So that will be accepted. Okay. And we'll be hearing from them again, I assume. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you. Good luck tonight. Yes. <laughs> okay, I get some it's so hard to talk and hear yourself. It's like. I'm, I'm just not used to this. You're still, you're still Slide live here. Yes. Do you want to mute this? How's that seem? All right. Mr. Decker, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. Thank you. You want it louder, Bernie? Or no, that's good. That's perfect. Okay. Okay, moving on to our second uh, appeal tonight. I'm going to call the. Uh, I'm going to call for a another roll. Robert Decker. Yes. Kathy Felton is absent. Alex. Yep. David Potter. Here. Brandon Sanowski here. Adam Sokolowski. Present. And John Staberski. Absent. Continuation of public hearing for the application of Charles Beto for a special permit to construct an addition on a lot that is non-conforming to current frontage requirements. Location 117 Old Main Street, map 49, lot 17. Mr. Beto, are you here? I am. You're here. Uh, any comments? Um, can I jump in as well? My name is Guy Ardry. My wife and I are um, the owners of the property and Charles is our architect working on this uh, project we're hoping to do. If it's okay with everyone, can I just give a quick background on, on this project? Um, we, we appeared about a year ago. Uh, what we're hoping to do is rebuild an old shed garage, uh, but also add some space behind it and above it. Um, we were initially appeared to get a, a special permit uh, relief for, um, for setback um, because we, uh, we were within 10 feet of the, uh, the, you know, the property line in the field next door. Uh, we tried to um, purchase that land um, from the neighbors, his, historic Deerfield. Um, they, they would not uh, do that. We were hoping to buy about five feet of land by about five feet by 20. Um, anyway, they were not willing to do that um, or explore any other options. Um, we appeared and uh, we were, um, you know, the, the petition was declined. Uh, since then, we, we uh, reworked the uh, designs for um, our addition 
um, uh, to meet those setback rules. Um, and we went, we got that done and then we went to uh, get permission to begin construction. And then we were alerted that we are uh, non-conforming from the uh, frontage. We, we have a flag lot uh, coming off of Old Main Street. Um, it's set back pretty far from the, uh, the main road. Um, this was a bit of a surprise. I mean, it, it's totally on us, but um, certainly a surprise because we had already done an addition on the house about five years ago uh, when, we, when we purchased the house and renovated it and we added a, um, a small dining room. Um, so anyway, uh, we were surprised to know that, that this existed. So anyway, um, that's where we are right now. Um, um, I sent Jennifer um, some uh, materials, just uh, the, uh, the layout of the property and, um, and uh, where the garage is and, and where the addition but behind the garage we were hoping to do. Um, I wish, unfortunately, you know, in Zoom world and COVID world, uh, I, I wish we had more of a chance to sort of show a picture of the, the setting of the uh, of the property in the house, we're set very you know a couple hundred feet back from uh, from the main road, and it's all big fields all around us. Um, there, uh, while th while the property line is right nearby, there's no structure anywhere nearby. Um, so uh, anyway, that's what we're hoping to do now is to get permission to uh, to add this. Um, any um, any any questions about the the uh, the layout? Do you, do you have those materials? And and Charles, anything to add or is that? No, I, I don't think so, Guy. I guess uh, did the board review the documents that Guy sent to Jen earlier or Sue? I see them uh, that show our proposed plan uh, for the addition and the relation um, uh, the property map. Yeah, I, I had a good chance to review the documents that were pushed out, um, but I'm not sure. I didn't see how it affects the frontage. Yeah, if you don't mind me interjecting, it also doesn't have the required square footage. Correct. Yeah, that seems to make sense. So so the paperwork then, the, the permit wasn't applied for correctly. No, we weren't, aware. We weren't aware at the time that uh, there was an uh, when we put forward the application that there was that there was an issue with the square footage. We had only been told that it was an issue with the frontage. So, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Uh, Decker. So I understand that at this time that the application is for a special exception, where they probably need a variance, and in order to meet the variance, they have to show that they have a hardship. Okay, and it may, in order to do it right, they may have to withdraw the current application and come back in and ask for a variance. I haven't got the application in front of me, but I think it's for a special exception. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what, you know, I, I think, but I don't, I don't have the application in front of me with the Zoom meeting. So I assume it's for a special exception and not for a variance. I don't have the, I don't, we don't have the paperwork in front of us with the Zoom meeting. Jen, do you have any paperwork at all or not? I don't think there's anything on there. Is there about the... Say that again? I'm sorry. There's no uh, reference in there for a hardship. I know that for a fact. No, so uh, the request was for um, the frontage. Is what, that's what it said on the application. And unfortunately it's frontage and area well it may be the, the it's a pre-existing lot there's no new lines have been created since zoning was established uh but it still probably needs a variance yeah. bob do you want to talk to that well there is a bylaw that doesn't grant variances to residential property just to touch on that um, so I think a special permit would be the correct application. And unfortunately, I denied it verbally and I 
you know, one we could say one way or the other. I, I felt like I said square footage also, but then the COVID hit and would have been best if it was in writing. So, but the fact still remains it's short frontage and square footage. Mr. Costa, are you available? I am, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Would you like to make a comment on this for us? Well, I, I'm, I'm at a loss as well because I've not been involved with respect to this permit application and I'm, I'm trying to pull up the materials. I do know that they were sent to me yesterday. I gave them a, a quick review, but obviously didn't know this issue was going to arise concerning type of relief applied for. So if you bear with me for a minute or two here so I can pull up the information, I'd be happy to. Mr. Chair, I have a question while Mr. Costa is looking through his email. Bernie? Yes. Uh, Adam had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Adam. Well, while Mr. Costa is researching it, I guess my question would be is, as it was posted and there's no abutters here, on this issue, um, if it's a square footage issue, uh, you know, when you go back to the posting, I think it's imperative for a decision like this that the abutters know what's going on. So I don't know, um, and I apologize to Mr. Mr. Beto and, and Mr. Audrey, but, um, you know, for some type of delay, but we may end up ourselves, if the, you know, the application was posted and the abutters weren't notified correctly of what type of permit was, um, being asked for, um, you know, they don't have the opportunity to be heard. But that's what it comes my only concern, you know, I, or that, that is one of my concerns. So basically what we have is an improperly filled out application or an incomplete, <clears throat> let's put it this way, incomplete application. So Mr. We're Chairman, dealing with, we're dealing with two issues. We're dealing with frontage and we're dealing with square footage. And I agree with you that the both uh, that the uh, abutters should be aware of what they're looking for and have a chance to respond. In all fairness, I think that's a good point, Adam. In all fairness to them, I I would concur with that. I just uh, unfortunately this this other issue did not arise until after we had already uh, made the application. Um, and, and again, this was a. A, su a surprise to us, given the fact that we'd already done work on the house before. Um, just to be totally candid, I, I, it's, and I don't want to waste anyone's time here. Um, the, our frontage is not going to change. Uh, the square footage of our lot is not going to change. Um, so I, I guess I, I want to ask the candid question: Do um, is there any um, is there any? Um, and I can't. Uh, you know, we would love to build new bedrooms for our kids who are getting, uh, who are older, they're teenagers now and they have tiny rooms. And that's the, uh, that's the main reason why we're doing this. I certainly can't claim that to be a hardship and I won't pretend to, to do that. Um, but um, the, uh, I, I guess the, the, the question I have is, um, um, is there any consideration to the, the, the site um, and the impact of the surrounding area or the lack thereof. Um, if that is not the case, um, if, if it absolutely is by the, the letter of the, the code uh, and there's no um, ability for um, any sort of wiggle room on that, then I, I don't want to waste anyone's time anymore. Um, if that is the case, then, um, then we can move on, I guess. But. Um, is the is the does the site of the uh, of the um, project have any bearing upon this this decision? Oh, we, I had a question for David. Was Dave? You had a question? No, you you lit up on the side on the screen there. Um, in all re due respect, you're asking us to tell you what to do, and we really can't do that. Okay. Okay. Um, you, you have to apply, the board makes a de decision on what your application says. For us to be giving legal advice, um, we do so at our own peril. We're not, uh, we're not lawyers. And I don't, you have to understand that that's what we're doing. We only, we only decide when you come forward with your plans, we see if it fits uh, our zoning bylaws and we make those decisions. Mr. Costa, 
Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I've now had an opportunity to, to pull I'm as well ask him. the materials. Um, and so um, I've got a few comments here. So the, the first is I with a couple of the previous speakers who commented on the sufficiency of the, uh, the notice and specifically referring back to the application that was submitted by the applicant. It does refer to uh, modification of a pre-existing non-conforming structure uh, on a lot that uh, it is non-conforming due to its frontage and nothing else. So uh, minimally, I, I think that there would need to be a, uh, an amendment to the application or a, a new application. I guess that's left to the discretion of the applicant and the board uh, to address the, the complete nature of the, the non-conforming structure. Um, with respect to the question that was just asked, I, I concur again entirely with you, Mr. Chairman that it's not the role of the, the Zoning Board of Appeals to be giving legal advice um, that's not to say necessarily that in every instance an applicant needs to obtain an attorney to assist him or her. Um, the zoning law addresses separately uh, special permits, uh, special permits for nonconformities, and variances. Those are three different types of relief and there are different standards that apply to each of them. So it's really a question for the applicant to determine what it is that they want to do. If they have a pre-existing nonconforming structure, and it's pre-existing uh, and it's non-conforming by, by nature of the fact that it's on an undersized lot and a lot that lacks sufficient frontage, there are provisions in the bylaw that allow for modification of these non-conforming structures. Uh, and the question becomes, does this project fit within um, that, that, uh, the, the, the authority of the board to grant the special permit? Or are they proposing uh, new violations of the bylaw that would trigger the need for variance? And if that's so, then, then that goes to the the applicant's question about hardship and the sorts of factors that would come into play in the context of a variance, but not necessarily in the context of a special permit. So the applicant has some work to do, it sounds like, but I would say minimally, the application needs to be modified to clarify the extent of the nonconformities that are associated with, uh, with the, the proposal. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And um, uh, again, I apologize, we uh, weren't able to I was under the impression that we were, um, we did have a complete application, but, uh, but I, I understand that that all makes sense. Um, is it too late to withdraw this application before a vote? No, it's not. Okay. Then I'd, uh, then we'd like to, we'd like to do that, please. Okay. Do I have, uh, uh someone that's going to move to accept? I moved it. We allow the, uh, applicant to withdraw the application without prejudice. I'll second that motion, Mr. Decker made. Okay. Board to take a vote to accept uh, <laughs> withdrawal from Charles Beto without prejudice. Mr. Decker. Yes. Alex. Yes. Mr. Potter. Yes. Myself, yes. Adam Sokolowski. Yes. Okay, it is accepted. So we will accept your um, withdrawal without prejudice. And you will have to come back to us, I guess. That's what you want to do. Okay, thank you all for your time. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Thank you. Hi, Bernie. Yes. John Pars uh, Pareski had his hand raised and he would like to say something, but we didn't open it up to the public for comment. Um, okay. Do you want to? allow him to speak yeah i think we uh board do we accept a chance for someone to say something well we already it's fine with me bernie well, we closed the well, we closed the meeting we didn't close the meeting yet though no we didn't close the hearing he wants to speak about this topic no he just raised his hand and he said he wants he said my hand's up is it in reference to this if it's in reference to this yes but if it's not something else no okay John, is it about the Beto and Audrey? No, was, I, that was by accident. I'm sorry. Oh. I apologize. <laughs> okay, All there's right. a lower your hand, so I'm going to disable you now. Thank you. Okay. Motion to close this uh, section of our meeting. Do I have a... I can make a motion that we close the uh, meeting here have... regarding the, uh, this property, uh, this hearing. Are we going to, uh, I guess that would be the motion. If we have a seconded, then we can have some discussion. 
Mr. Decker. Well, I'll second it for the purpose, but I'm just trying to figure out, are you trying to close the whole thing for no. tonight? No, or I'm just closing this hearing, this part of the meeting. Well, this continuation, number seven. Okay, well, we'll move off that agenda. We move to the next item on the agenda. Okay. I All think. Right. All right. Uh, Chair, can I just make that announcement about how uh, attendees and panelists can ask questions? Because we didn't um, go over that. And I know it's going to be frustrating for people who don't know. So I just want to say it ahead of time. Is that okay? It is with me. Yes. Okay. All right. So okay. One, one quick thing. I wanted to um, just give everyone a chance to walk around, take a break for a couple of minutes. How's that sound? Good. All right. Let's take a, uh, we'll reconvene at 20 minutes of uh, five. Is that all right? Fine. Sure. Thank you. Hi, Charles. Hey, Jen. Oh, oh hold on. There. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. I was just um, I was just sending you a, a chat note, um, and uh, I was wondering if we if Guy decides he wants to come back and reapply. Um, it, one thing to be clear that we have to include uh, the issue of of square footage as along with frontage. It wasn't it wasn't clear to me whether we are applying for a a special permit or a variance of both. I think that's a conversation for Bob. You did Bob Costa? No, Bob Walden. Oh, Bob Walden. Okay. Yeah. So you can just give him a call tomorrow and chat with him about what you, how you want to proceed after this. So he'll okay. tell you. Okay. okay? So he's the guy to talk to. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks so much. Nice to see you. Okay. Nice to see you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.
the dog in the room. Casey, I made him a, a co-host.
Oh, okay. I got you. So you Thank you. Live again. All right. It's now uh, four forty-two, I believe. We're going to open our meeting back up again. Take another roll call, please. Robert Decker. Yes. Kathy Felton. Alex. Yep. David Potter. Here. Bernard Sadowski. Here. Adam Sokolowski. Present. John Staberski. Absent. All right, good evening or good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, opening statement. This meeting is open to its open state meeting guidelines as recommended. We're asking all questions. The responses are directed to the chair, please. We ask that all people be respectful of others' opinions. Okay, this is what we're going to follow, this agenda. We're going to go through each of the areas that we have to uh, designate what, what uh, is important and we can vote on and make our decision on all property lines, adjacent public streets, existence of proposed building structures, parking areas, and service areas, sewage, refuse, and other waste disposal, facilities of groundwater drainage, both temporary and permanent, future expansion areas. <coughs> all questions and response should be directed to the chair. Individual board members should not be targeted. Okay, then we're gonna go, this is the procedure we're gonna follow, please. We're going to uh, comments by each of the, uh, the presenters. Then we're gonna allow the board members to ask questions, comments from the public, and then um, board members may ask a question again to follow up on the first three areas. Any questions by anybody? Okay. I have Let's a question, go. Mr. Chair. Yes. Well, statement. I might just, I'm just going to, uh, if I have to uh, have a couple bites of my sandwich here to get through this meeting tonight, I might just take my view, uh, video off, but I'll still be listening. Okay. Well, we're going to plan on taking a break sometime, right, probably around six, six o'clock. Okay. Okay. We're going to take a break, maybe more than one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, number one, property lanes. Do we have any comments by the um, Dollar General? Ernie? Yes. Can I just say again how people can ask questions? Oh, I'm questions? sorry. I'm sorry, Jennifer. Go ahead. Explain okay. to them how to get on there. It's okay. So if you are calling in you on your phone, you can dial star nine, and that will raise your hand feature. And... It, I will answer them in the way that they come in as far as questions go. If you are on a web, you can use the raise your hand feature that will do the same thing and it will put, put a hand up and I will answer questions as 
they, they, they're, they populate the, in order in which I receive them. And that's only when Bernie tells me that he's ready for comment from the public will the attendees be able to ask their questions. Uh, I do see that there's two hands written, written already, but we really haven't begun. So you can lower your hand until it's open to the public because it depends on what they're talking about at that time. I would appreciate that. Um, panelists can also um, use the raise your hand feature and Bernie can see that and can um, ask you or I will ask him to ask you when he opens comments up to the panelists, which is everybody that can see each other's pictures um, on the screen now. And if you are a caller and your name is not showing, please say your name before asking your question. Okay. Thank you. We're, we're all set. Um, <clears throat> Dollar General, are you set to uh, make any comments about all the property lines? Well, with regard to the property lines, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me introduce myself. Mark Donahue from Fletcher Tilton. I'm an attorney in Worcester and I represent the applicant. Uh, with regard to the property lines, the property lines of the site are reflected in the site development plans as submitted as part of the application uh, and reflect the current conditions of the property. Any questions from board members? None. I, uh, okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair? Yes. yes I've, yeah. just, I've just been notified that Mr. Staberski is going to be trying to log he, in here in the next few minutes, okay? Okay. So I can, as soon as he logs in, have him log in so I can check him off. All right. I'm going to try to get my video back to you, which you can hear me fine. <laughs> yes, we can any, hear you. Any questions from board members? Okay, we'll move to the uh, second part, which is comments by the public. Now, please stay on this topic. And we're going to limit you to three minutes. If, if, if I might, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, it, it, it's been quite a while since we submitted our application and had our first initial hearing. And as part of that, the applicant was asked to follow up on certain things. And so in that context, before jumping to comments from the public, we'd like an opportunity to update the board as to the information that has been submitted um, since the last public hearing and to touch specifically on the requirements that this board needs to make findings on with regard to the special permit, with your permission. In reference to the property lines but not not as to the property lines my apologies i, I no, thought you were not comments from the public on other issues okay um when that comes up more than what? there's not a problem but we're we're asking that you stay on the topic so we don't get muddled on this situation please my apologies okay all right <laughs> public comments please mr chairman looking to see if we have Mr. Chairman, it's uh, it's Adam Costa. Uh, oh, yes, go ahead, Adam. Could I ask a question of you? Yeah. So you're you're referencing property lines, and, and maybe I'm a bit unclear, but I suspect that if I'm unclear, that maybe some of the other panelists and maybe some of the members of the public are unclear too. So you, you reference property lines. I think you uh, mentioned two or three or four other topics. Are you reading from a particular section of the bylaw, and are you attempting? No, we had set up a format of. Uh, how we're going to handle this and we went right by our zoning bylaws and those that was number one in the list that considerations we had to make on 50 I guess my, whatever it was yeah my, my confusion is where these considerations are coming from because it, the application before you is uh, f first and foremost an application for a special permit and so you you've got You've got a six part test in section 5320 of your zoning bylaw that provides six criteria that need to be satisfied. And then you've got sort of an overarching determination that the board has to make about the benefits versus the detriments of the Correct. project. So wh where, does, where does this issue of property lines fit in? I just, when I was going through this, I found the first one. That was the first one I saw on, what did you say it was 53? 5320. Maybe I've got the wrong section. Fifty 
Oh, I am sorry. So I stand corrected. Chairman. I stand corrected. Yes. Mr. Decker? Uh, Mr. Sokolowski with a question. Mr. Sokolowski. Well, I, I'm not 100% sure of what the best way to complete any task is, but, um, you know, we, we have gotten a lot of new information, some new drawings and stuff from the applicant. We've gotten a lot of stuff from the public too that's been, you know, very helpful and insightful and I understand that. So, um, you know, based on the four things that Mr. Costa brought up, um, or six there, um, you know, I don't know if it makes sense for either you to give a summary of what we, what we did back in February or, or January, or, you know, give it a minute for Mr. Staberski to get on. So we have all of our full members here. I don't, I mean, I guess we can definitely take public comment if you want to take public comment, but I think um, it would be fruitful for all the full members that may be voting to be present if the applicant's going to give their presentation tonight or if they're going to be, you know, what, what the story is with that. I mean, me personally, I've gone through the documents at, at length, but it might be uh, helpful for that, for Mr. Don here to give his overview of what's changed with the, you know, with, with the site as far as what their proposal is and how they've addressed some of the needs that were asked. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Decker. I agree with uh, Mr. Sokolowski. The uh, big thing is we asked them to do an extensive amount of work. They did the work and I think we owe it to them to sit there and try to explain uh, everything that they did and how they did it and what their conclusions were. And it might save some time going forward tonight. It's up to you. Okay, I have to apologize. I'm wrong here. I am wrong here. 5321 is what we should be looking at. I was did not look at 5321. So my uh, my topics of this meeting are totally wrong. But we can go by those if we if we decide we're going to do them. And Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, if I could make another comment, just to yep. to maybe add something, and and I offer this not in an effort to hijack your meeting, but just to sort of shed some light on my experience. These six special permit criteria aren't unique to Deerfield. Uh, yep. Similar yep. criteria exist in probably 75 to 90% of the communities in Massachusetts. And so um, having sat through many of these board meetings, I can tell you, I think it is challenging to try and coordinate either an applicant's presentation or even to structure a meeting around addressing each of these six criteria sequentially, because there, there's, there's naturally going to be some sort of an overlap when you're discussing uh, aspects of the project that affect community needs, so affect traffic safety uh, or neighborhood character. So I, I tend to agree with the previous two members of your board and the comments they had that um, what often makes the most sense is providing an opportunity for the applicant to make a brief presentation really at the start of every session of the hearing to update the board members on what's been done. And then when the board members questions follow or the members of the public follow with their own questions, inevitably those questions should, and I leave it to the board to, to be sure that they do, uh, address and sort of revolve around those six criteria because that is the basis for the decision you're expected to render. I don't have a problem with that. If, they, if that's what we want to do, the board wants to do that, fine. I just try to keep it orderly, but if that's what we're going to do, I don't have a problem with it. That's, I'm, I'm one person. Um, and if the board decides that it wants to have a, a presentation, I was going to do it step by step, and I was wrong in what I did. So we'll start over and go from there. Does the rest of the board, Mr. Decker, you agree we should have them present uh, their materials? I think it would save a, a lot of time and explanation and what have you if the petitioner is, is allowed to make his presentation and uh, it may answer a lot of the questions. Uh, some people may not like answers, but 
Um, he will have an opportunity to put his best foot forward. We ask for an awful lot of information and, uh, you know, it's best that they, if he gives it to us uh, in a nice overview and uh, what have you. I sat there and looked through all those documents. There's an awful lot of paper there. Okay. And I'm not an engineer. Okay, Mr. Sokolowski, you agree? Well, I don't know if we, you know, you're running the meeting and I'm glad to see Mr. Staberski on my screen now here. So, so uh, John, you really haven't missed anything on the uh, Dollar General uh, thing. We've just uh, gone over a couple of, of uh, minuscule things and no presentations or public comment have been taken yet. David, you want to hear what they have to say? You Very much so. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Alex? Alex? Uh, yes, I agree. I think we should let them present. Okay, and Mrs. Tversky. Absolutely, are they? Okay, so uh, Mr. Donahue, I don't know who your representatives are, so please start, I guess, with your presentation. And I apologize that I made a mistake here. No apologies necessary, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Once again, for the record, my name's Mark Donahue. I'm a lawyer in Worcester with the firm of Fletcher Tilton, and I represent um, the applicant with regard to this application. Uh, to set the table, the board will remember that this application involves a special permit to construct a 9,319 square foot uh, one level building uh, on a lot consisting of 86,589 total square feet. It requires a special permit, therefore, uh, to build the additional 5,319 square feet uh, with the intent that the property is to be used for retail purposes. As I indicated, as Mr. Costa echoed, the governing um, portions of your zoning bylaw are sets forth in section 5320, which sets forth the criteria for the board for determination of special permits of this nature. We reviewed those at the January 23rd meeting uh, and made progress on a number of the points. Um, so I'd like to go through those in particular. Uh, and as part of that, make introduction to other members of the team who are here this evening. But for a matter of over a view uh, with me this evening to answer any questions the board may have is Chad Brubaker, uh, a principal of the applicant, uh, Sean Kelly of Vanessa Associates, our traffic consultant, and Austin Turner of Bowler Engineering, the design civil engineers. One of the criteria that is set forth in your zoning bylaw with regard to a special permit is the adequacy of utilities. And we reviewed in January the utility system uh, to service this property. Uh, our, my notes do not indicate any questions from the board with regard to that. And so we're glad to answer any questions that may remain, but we do not have any additional information with regard to the adequacy of utilities. We believe that the record before you reflects that all utilities required for the proposed building are present uh, and accounted for. The bylaw further talks in terms of potential fiscal impacts upon the town or town services, tax base, and employment. We talked at some length at our last meeting with regard to how the applicant sees this as positive on all of those impacts, that it will have a positive tax revenue to the town. It'll create new employment opportunities and will uh, have very little requirement as far as town services of public safety in any fashion. There were no questions left from the board at the end of the last meeting. We have not presented any additional information with regard to that, but similarly are prepared to discuss any issues the board may have on that uh, topic uh, this evening. Impacts on the environment, uh, we reviewed uh, with you last meeting and there were in fact comments from the public with regard to that particular standard. We submitted to you and refer you to uh, some information that was available originally with the planning board. Uh, we had previously submitted to you the stormwater drainage report as prepared by Bowler Engineering. We submitted as part of the package that we delivered electronically to the board, the peer review report of tie and bond uh, on that uh, stormwater report, uh, and also um, the report of the Franklin Regional Council on governments and the response of the applicant to that. We also submitted a site evaluation report done by, uh, for a wetland analysis. Uh, back then, which indicated a study to indicate no presence of wetland resource areas. The qualifications of the author of the site evaluation report we submitted, which was dated August 3rd, 2018, were called into question by some members of the public. Uh, we took that seriously and the board's concern on that. 
went forward and obtained an additional report, which has been submitted uh, to both you and to the Conservation Commission pursuant to a determination of applicability. And we have received word from the Conservation Commission that they have scheduled a meeting with regard to that determination of applicability for August 27th, I believe. Um, Beyond the issue of whether there were certain wetlands present near the front of the property, there were no other issues raised with regard to the environmental condition of the property. We're glad to address any additional questions that you may have on that. A significant portion of our July 20, I strike that January 23rd meeting was spent with regard to the issue of traffic. And you have a fair amount of historical information that we have made part of your record including the initial report done of Vanessa and Associates for the planning board, uh, updates of Vanessa and Associates, peer review by Ty and Bond, re uh, response to the peer review prepared by Bowler Engineering, and further uh, in indication as to the methodology used by Vanessa and Associates. And all of that is now part of your record. And I refer you to those written documents. Uh, Sean Kelly is the author of those and certainly glad to answer any questions as is uh, Mr. Turner from Bowler Engineering. Uh, some additional questions were raised and the need for perhaps additional improvements in the traffic corridor. And with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to turn this part of the presentation over to Mr. Kelly to bring the board present uh, as to the information that we have gathered since the January 23rd meeting. Okay, board recognizes Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Again, Sean Kelly with Vanass and Associates. Um, if it pleases the board, what I think what I'd like to do is just walk you through, again through the improvement plan that we have proposed on the intersection of Route 5 and 10 um, with Mill Village Road and North Main Street. Um, the enhancements we talked about at the last meeting to kind of refresh everyone's memory and then some of the additional improvements we're proposing um, now based on additional consultation with MassDOT. Um, I'm not sure, do we, do we have this plan teed up or I can share a screen, whatever's easiest? Easiest for um, Mr. Kelly to share his screen, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you. Let me, um, does everyone see this okay? I don't yeah. see anything on why. It's not come up yet, but okay. there it is. Yep. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. So this, this essentially just to um, zoom in a little bit, just to orient yourself, um, the main line five and 10 runs north south, even though on this plan it looks as though it's running east west. Um, the proposed site, again, we're in the, the northwest quadrant of the intersection of, of 5 and 10 with Mill Village Road and North Main Street. Uh, just to kind of refresh everyone's memory, you know, MassDOT had done some study at this location uh, a number of years back to look at some potential safety measures that would enhance um, you know, the operational safety of the intersection, um, improve traffic operations. Uh, and most of those measures, quite frankly, were not implemented at that time. Um, we've been working with MassDOT. I, I know initially there was some discussion about whether a, a new RSA road safety audit was, was needed for this location. Um, the determination was made that it wasn't and, and that it would be more um, prudent and, and beneficial to actually put those funds towards the actual um, design and, and implementation of measures to improve safety. So today, um, five and 10 in each direction carries essentially one travel lane. Um, so if you're making a left turn onto Mill Village Road going northbound or making a left turn onto North Main Street going southbound, um, you, you know, vehicles don't have the ability to bypass unless they typically travel around you in the shoulder. Uh, as part of our improvements, what we're looking to do is to, to formalize turning lanes, which was a recommendation in the RSA, so that vehicles that are making that left can make a safe maneuver, getting out of the through lane, allowing through traffic to bypass both northbound um, and southbound direction. Uh, in conjunction with that, we work with DOT to come up with, a, again, a kind of a back-to-back -back left turn lane design where in addition to the southbound left turn lanes up to North Main Street, we would also have a northbound left turn lane into the sites. So the vehicles that are turning into the site, and again, um, just to refresh everyone's memory, it's a, it's a fairly low volume movement. It's in the order of you know, 20 cars an hour, car every three minutes, would have the ability to, to pull out of the main lines so that vehicles could bypass. Um, some of the other issues out here, they're, you know, the, the, the signage that exists, some of it, it doesn't meet current criteria through MUTCD. Some of it's just old and, and worn away. Some of the signs, the street signs aren't very legible, um, font size too small, et cetera. So we've agreed, you know, we'll upgrade those and, and um, bring, bring all the signage into current criteria. Uh, it's a dark intersection. If you've ever traveled through here at night, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of that. You know, it's not well illuminated and, and the crash history showed that some of the crashes at this location 
you know, we're nighttime crashes with visibility potentially being a, a contributing factor. Uh, we've agreed to install an overhead street light um, to better illuminate the intersection. Um, and then I think that, you know, the, one of the biggest concerns that, you know, has come up not only from, you know, dealing with DOT, and, and, um, but also in the community was the, the provision of, of bicycle accommodations along this corridor. Um, to the south of, of North Main Street and Mill Village Road, um, you know, bicycle accommodations are provided. There's exclusive bicycle lanes in both directions. But as you get towards the intersection proper and then moving further north, uh, those accommodations, quite frankly, go away. In, in some instances, you have really no shoulder at all. It's maybe one foot. Um, so, so what we've done is we've worked with DOT to come up with a plan that, you know, we will work in conjunction with them to implement that will provide, um, you know, a consistent minimum five foot shoulder. Um, so, so what it does is it takes that existing bike lane today that ends and it'll carry it straight through the intersection moving north. And then really where it's, it's even more beneficial coming southbound where there really is, is absolutely no shoulder today to maintain that five foot shoulder straight through the intersection, you know, picking up beyond Mill Village Road and then continuing southbound into the exclusive bike lanes. So this is a, this is a measure that, that quite frankly doesn't exist today. It, it, it adheres to Mass DOT's, you know, complete streets design criteria in terms of bicycle accommodations. It meets some of the objectives of, of, of green dock criteria in terms of, you know, multimodal access by providing those, those um, bicycle accommodations and, and not um, relying on SOV. Um, additionally, we've also worked with NASDAQ. We will be providing, it's not shown on this plan, but there will also be a connection directly to Mill Village Road, um, which will allow, you know, lo the local community, the residential community located to the, uh, the west of the site to access the, the site without having to travel onto Route 5 and 10. So whether you're on Mill Village or the, you know, the multitude of roads that connect off of, of Lee Road from Mill Village, you know, if you want to walk or bicycle to the, to the site, you can do so and not have to travel into the, the Route 5 and 10 corridor. Um, so that's where we are right now. You know, we have this plan into DOT. It, it's, it's under review, but, you know, based on the comments and feedback we received, you know, this is, this is essentially what they're looking for. And again, we're going to work with DOT um, to, to provide these, these measures, particularly the, the bicycle accommodations that today um, you know, don't exist. That's, um, that's really an update as to where we are since the last meeting. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that, you know, that anyone might have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a few questions. Okay. Uh, Chair recognizes Mrs. Taberski. Uh, is there any accommodation for pedestrians, uh, particularly a crosswalk across uh, 5 and 10? I know if you're having bike traffic, uh, there's going to be bike traffic crossing the uh, intersection and going in and out of there. Um, so is there has there any thought or any uh, design considerations to having some sort of crosswalk or pedestrian crossing? I mean, during during our discussions with MassDOT, there hasn't been a, a, an expressed desire to provide a crosswalk there. I mean, it's a, it is, as I'm sure you're aware, a, a fairly high speed um, corridor. Sometimes, you know, the provision of a crosswalk, you know, it gives a, a, in some ways a false sense of security where people feel that they, you know, it is a safe crossing. Uh, we can explore it with DOT as part of the access uh, permit review, but, uh, but as of now, there's, there's been no, um, no indication that that's something DOT is looking for. And again, well, I would remind the board that, you know, this is a DOT corridor, so ultimately, um, you know, they have full jurisdiction and say as to what we ultimately, you know, implement and build out there. But, uh, you know, a, a crosswalk does have a bearing on safety of the traveling pedestrian and bicycling public. Um, have you guys independently made any considerations as to whether that enhances safety? Again, I, I would repeat the last comment, which is that we've, you know, we, we have not recommended putting a crosswalk out here, you know, given the travel speeds, um, you know, it's, I, I don't know that it would necessarily enhance the safety as much as it would give a false sense of security for people crossing the street. We can, we can certainly discuss it with DOT. But sense is it's you know it's on a, on a street of this of this uh, speed and volume it's, it's typically not something um, you would put in um, the second question I have is uh, you mentioned that there is now going to be an access off of Miller Village Road on this plan that yes. is not shown anywhere and anything that's been presented to us is that accurate uh, I, I believe the site plan package uh, depicts it. Our plans is it really focus more on the on the on the roadway improvements, um, but I but I believe the site plan package will, will depict how that how that's proposed and designed. Good, good uh, evening, 
Uh, for the record, this is Austin Turner with, with Bowler. And as Mr. Donahue had mentioned, we're the civil engineering consultant on this project. What I believe, what I believe Sean was referring to is, is part of our prior discussions with the board and it, through this review process, the connection that we're referring to is actually a pedestrian and bicycle connection into the property. So there's a direct connection that we're proposing um, from a, a bike path and a sidewalk connection from the front apron of the building directly to Mill Village Road. And that was done at the request of the board. So we're not proposing a vehicular access, but it is a pedestrian and bicycle access that is being considered. And that is included as part of the site development plans that have been submitted. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood Mr. Kelly. I thought he had said that th there was a vehicular access so people who are driving from Mill Village wouldn't have to drive out onto the road to get into. Uh, no, we, we, we project very low. I mean, the volume of traffic coming in from Mill Village Road is, is literally in the order of, you know, a car or two per hour. You know, that, that level of volume wouldn't necessitate its own, um, you know, driveway specific to the corridor. I, I do have to uh, do have to express my opinion that I believe that that is a dangerous intersection for bicyclists, and I uh, know for a fact that that particular route, the crossing of of five and ten on North Main Street, is part of uh, the Franklin County Commission's uh, bikeway pass. So it's a path that is used it's on maps it's a future layout for uh for part of our bikeways and i know and the fact that we have uh you know bike lanes and not crossings for bikes is of a significant concern uh, from a safety perspective any other questions by board members on the traffic issue I think it would probably be uh, best if we opened this up for comments from the uh, public board. I'm going to recommend that we open this up now for comments from the public on, on this specific item of uh, traffic flow and safety, please. And try to stay on this subject, not something else to make us helpful. Yes. Hi. Um, I want to say that we've been given advice from council that we should take the chat comments first. So we can read them into record and you can respond and then we will go to that raised hand in the order that they've been received. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I got to apologize. This, this whole thing is, uh, is it's new. Uh, I know it's, it's confusing to me. I'm not comfortable with this thing, but we're, we're, we're I'm going to try to do the best I can. That's all I can okay. tell you. I'm going to do the best I can. I apologize, but uh, I'm not computer savvy and I don't want to be. Okay, so let me start. This is from Leonard Hubber. Uh, he writes about utilities. What is the data on the adequacy of utilities? Fiscal, what is the data on a typical usage of public safety services at other comparable stores? Okay, can I have a response from somebody? Uh, Mr. Donahue, you have somebody that would like to respond to that? Oh, Are I, you? I, I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, in the, in the spirit of trying to stay on track, we, we haven't finished our presentation. Okay. Traffic is a big issue. Let, let me, if I might. Traffic is a big issue. Um, so it made sense to take board comments. We're glad if the board's desire is to open the issue with regard to traffic. But I think if we start going now into something other than traffic, we're going to end up after sunset without knowing exactly what we've done or achieved. So okay. my my recommendation would be stay in a lane and either run it into the ground or elite, or agree that we're going to just move on at some point, but not jump around. Uh, okay. I think I asked that we stay on track, which was going to be um, to address the traffic issue right now, one at a time, because I think you're doing a great job on the way your presentation, you're doing what I wanted to do, but I don't want to start wandering around because we're going to lose sight of what we're doing. All and right. I think, so I have some questions about traffic. That fine. I, that's what I want. I think the board would like to hear it in, in just traffic right now. We'll go into utilities later on, but we'll let's deal with traffic right now since that's come up. Okay. We had a question from a board member, so let's follow up with comments from the public or questions from the public, please. Okay, so this is from Leonard Hubber. He says, uh, Traffic, what is the methodology of a traffic study? And then he says, when was the previous study by DOT 
dash, I mean, slash audit. And then he asked, the average of 20 cars per hour is irrelevant. Needs should be determined by the maximum, not the average, which could, which could include times of very little traffic. What is it the average of? Okay, I can, I can take those, I think. I'll, uh, I'll do the, third, the first part first. Uh, the methodology with which we do our studies is pretty straightforward. I know, you know this may be repetitious for the board, but essentially we go out, we look at existing traffic conditions, we look at existing, existing safety conditions, we look at existing vehicle speeds, you know, crash records, you, you name it, and then we, we project into the future what the traffic will look like seven years down the road. It's the state uh, guideline. We take the traffic that the project would generate, you know, we add that to the traffic that would be out there independent of the project and we look at what the impacts are. Um, when, I, when I talk about the, the, the 20 cars, you know, average, to be clear, that's the average hour. So this isn't, uh, you know, just the average hour of the day. This is the average amount of traffic you'll see on the, that five to six o'clock at night or that, you know, noon to one in the afternoon on a Saturday when the stores are busiest. So we're always looking at the busiest time. We're not looking at, you know, just the average time of the day, it's, but it's the average traffic during that, that peak time. Um, with regard to the RSA, the, the last RSA that was done out here was done, I believe it was 2011 or 2012 um, when MassDOT did it. And, and, and just to give the board a little, a little history, there was a question as to whether or not, you know, a new RSA is required. And, uh, you know, RSA, it's not, a, it's not an arbitrary thing when you decide is, is one needed or isn't one needed. There's a, there's, a, there's a formula that goes into play that looks at the crash history, the crash severity, you know, were there, were there, were there, was it just property damage fender benders? Was it uh, injuries? Were there fatalities? What happened at this location um, is a few years ago, there was a fatality on five and 10 involving a bicyclist at, at Mill Village Road. It wasn't at this end of Mill Village Road. It was at the other end of Mill Village Road where it reconnects to five and 10 in the vicinity of the gas station. That fatality got incorrectly located onto this intersection, which brought it into the need to do an RSA. Uh, we reviewed this with the police department and they've, they've concurred. It, it didn't happen anywhere near here. It was almost three miles up the road. We reviewed with DOT and when you, when you take that intersection out of here, we're not, we're not an HSIP designation, RSA designation intersection. We reviewed with DOT what the, you know, the best uh, you know, path moving forward was to, uh, to you know, enhance the safety out here and, and quite frankly, you know, what, did it make sense to do a report that would have recommendations to put in left turn lanes, to put in overhead lighting, to look at potentially a flashing beacon when there's a, a report on the shelf that recommended these things years ago that simply either due to funding or whatever reason it is never got done. It, 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 you know, we, knew, we know what, what needs to be done here to make the intersection safer. And quite frankly, Dollar General and Liskiotti have, have stepped to the plate and said, you know, we'll just do these measures. They've been recommended, they've been sitting on the shelf for a number of years, you know, clearly the left turn lanes are warranted and, and makes sense. Clearly additional lighting out here makes sense. Clearly bringing this, the, the signage up to compliance so that it meets current METC design criteria makes sense. And they've made that commitment. So that's, you know, that's where we are with, with regard to the RSA. I, I think those were the, the three questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I, uh, may yes. I follow up? Uh, I recognize Mr. Stamerski. Uh, you mentioned the fatality on the other end of Mill Village Road. Isn't it accurate that the general conditions of 5 and 10 at the other end of Mill Village Road and this, then where this uh, particular intersection is, is generally consistent? The cars travel about the same speed. There's about the same amount of buildings and the same amount of traffic that it's, it's something that even though it might have occurred five miles away, uh, it's still a fatality. It's still on that road. It's still involved a bicyclist. I, I you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I have no, no knowledge as to what the speeds are in that area. And I have no knowledge as to what the volumes are comparative to where we are down here. Um, I, I will say that, you know, I, I went through that accident report. I looked at it specifically to see what happened. It, it looks as though there was a, someone driving in the shoulder. I don't know if the shoulders out there are meet the design criteria that we're designing this to make it safe for bicyclists. But, but what happened was someone was driving northbound. There was some construction going on, and the motorist said, I, I, I looked at the construction to see what was happening. For a moment, I just lost you know, sight of where I was driving. I drove into the shoulder and, and hit, hit the bicyclist. It wasn't a, I'm not sure that it was necessarily a deficiency in terms of the, the corridor so much as it was that it was a distracted motorist that wasn't watching where she was driving, and she hit the woman. And, and it's, it's a tragedy. It's a fatality. 
what we're trying to do really is focus on where we are and what we can do to make sure that, you know, we improve this course that, you know, we don't have the potential for those situations in front of our site. And that's why when you look at the course today in front of us with the one two foot shoulders where there's absolutely zero bicycle accommodations in front of our site, we're bringing it up to that five foot shoulder to provide that safe avenue for bicyclist traffic. So, you know, I, I can't speak to what the traffic or the safety or the speed is three miles from now. We, you know, we do know someone tragically was killed there. Um, but what we're doing is, is trying to make sure that along our frontage, the improvements that we implement, you know, bring things up to the standards that bicycle accommodations northbound and southbound on 5 and 10 um, are provided in a safe manner. Well, that's why I'm suggesting east and westbound, too, because it's just a dangerous area. Right. This, and again, I, I, I do recognize that, you know, that there has been discussion about it being a dangerous intersection. But I think it's important to understand that, you know, MassDOT has specific criteria where they say, for an unsignalized intersection in this district, you know, based on the total amount of volume that goes to the intersection is a crash rate. It's an average crash rate. And if you're above the average crash rate, you know, it's an intersection where you may want to take a closer look at the, at, you know, potential safety issues that are there. If you're below, typically MassDOT says there is no, you know, safety concern immediate to that location. This location, to be clear, is below that crash rate. So we, we you know, I, I, it's been said many times, it's an unsafe location, unsafe location. But by MassDOT's criteria, this is not an unsafe location. The crash rate for this intersection falls below their crash rate for unsignalized intersections in this district. If, if I might just amplify on that, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, um, I, I, I think what is beyond debate is that your, the- State your is, name, please. Sure, Mark Donahue, on behalf of the applicant, um, is that the, the information and the, uh, the proposals that have been put forth the, by the applicant the peer review that's been done uh, as part of the planning board review and now submitted to made part of your record demonstrates beyond a reasonable doubt that the intersection is safer with the improvements than it is today. Uh, and that therefore is a material benefit of the development to do long awaited improvements to this area to improve the shoulders, increase visibility, increase lighting, improve signage, add turn lanes, all of which improve the current condition that exists there today, as opposed to debating what the condition is. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Can you. I be recognized? Yes. Uh, just Mr. Mr. Sokolowski is recognized. <clears throat> well, I just want to make sure that, um, I know you're not a huge Zoom guy, but our attendees have jumped up quite a bit and I know that you want to keep things moving forward. So all this yeah. information was pushed out. It's all available on the town website. So a lot of people that are asking questions uh, in the chat, the answers to those questions are available on the town website up top. And if um, any member of the board doesn't have access or feels as though they don't have anything, we can click on that and you can uh, review it, um, such as the the pedestrian access, bicycle access off Mill Village, um, which was which was provided. I, it's uh, one of the back pages, uh, and and that's that's basically all I have. I I think we can move on from traffic. I know people have their opinions, but I mean, adding bike lanes and adding turn lanes is a step forward. All right, thank you, Mr. Sokolowski. Um, Mr. Stabreski, just let me interrupt a minute, please. I think what we're going to do is, um, when we're done with this, Mr. Donahue, I'd like you to continue with your, uh, because if this is going to continue, we'll be here forever. If you, I think you need to make your full presentation. I'm going to, I, I think it'd be best to allow you to do that. Uh, let the board members make their questions if they need to, and then we'll let the public make comments afterwards so we can facilitate this since Mr. Mr. Sokolowski is correct. They can answer a lot of their own questions by looking at the website. Now, Ms. Garner, I am not getting up on my screen anyone who is calling in. I'm not getting that. So when I'm not recognizing people, it's not because I'm ignoring people, but on my participation list, it's not there. Okay. So you're so... Gonna, I'm going to leave it up to you to recognize this the person who calls in. Okay. We ask so that they do I have one, two, three, four, five, six hand raised, and I have a couple other chats. So it's up to you whether you want me to um, let them I, speak. I think what we need to do is 
let's, this is going to, I'm mulling through this. I think we need to let Mr. Donahue go through his full presentation, and then we'll go back and address these issues as we go. But I think we owe him that much. So, oh, okay. any Tell questions by the board to... about my decision? But uh, Mr. Staberski, I know you had a question. I want to let you finish, though. Thank you. Mr. Staberski, recognized. No, I'm, I'm, I'll withdraw my question. Go Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and please, if, if, if the uh, person <clears throat> calls in uh, date, I mean name and date, name and street, and then we have to recognize the, these members that are speaking, because I don't think they know who it is. I can tell what's going on. So then I need to recognize the speaker so that the people that are on the voice end of this know who they're talking to. Okay, that would be helpful. Like I said, I don't, if their hands are raised, I have no information on that. So I'm leaving that up to you, please. Mr. Donahue, would you continue? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Um, let, let me, out of the interest of, of time, turn our attention to the criteria referred to as neighborhood character uh, in your bylaw. Um, and if Mr. Turner can pull up the, the neighborhood visual that we used in January, uh, that, that'll at least begin the, our presentation of that uh, with your permission. Um, because I think what it indicates is that one of the issues that uh, we struggle with and the board may struggle with is what exactly constitutes the neighborhood that this project needs to be consistent with. Uh, the property is, is within uh, and to some extent is in the center of uh, an active commercial district, which has a number of large buildings uh, that house different types of uh, industries uh, running from self storage to uh, production. And we utilize this um, visual before to demonstrate in relation to our site, how there are buildings that are within the same proximity, in fact, very close proximity to the residential neighborhood uh, that are far in excess of size and scope. Uh, and I'm, I'm referring specifically to one Plain East Road with regard to that. Uh, this visual, I think, demonstrates the applicant's contention that the proposed 9,300 square foot retail building is consistent with the neighborhood that it's part of, which is the commercial corridor that it is laying within. We point in specifically to the board's, uh, it, it may not be the most recent, but a fairly recent action in this corridor and refer to the uh, permit that this board granted with regard to 247 Greenfield Road, uh, which is at the top of the slide that you see there. And I point to it, Mr. Chairman, for the purpose of juxtaposing the impact of the size of the site and the size of the buildings, and therefore its impact upon surrounding areas. That, those buildings as shown there are just a, share, a, a shade below 40,000 square feet in gross floor area. Um, the lot consists of 137, 140 square feet. Therefore, the buildings take up more than 29% of the lot area. Um, when you compare that to our proposal of the 9,319 square foot building and the 86,589 square foot lot, our lot coverage by buildings alone is 10.76. And therefore, we believe that it is consistent. Now, there is a fair point that, uh, that there are individuals who chose to have uh, to buy into residences hard against an existing commercial zone. Those individuals, assumedly when they bought, knew they were buying uh, directly next to property that was zoned commercial and could be used in accordance with the commercial standards of the Deerfield zoning bylaw. Uh, and th so this board asked us in January to provide some better context in visual documentation as to the visual impact of the site and how the various forms of mitigation, particularly fencing and landscaping, would, inter would uh, interfere, interfere is the wrong term, would mitigate the visual impact of those. And what I'm gonna ask with your permission, Mr. Chairman, is for Mr. Turner to review those, um, those slides which have been made part of the public record already. Austin. The board, board recognizes Mr. Turner, please. Good evening and, and thank you again for your time and for the record, Austin Turner with Bowler. And as Mark mentioned, we are the land development consultants on this project. So I'm gonna switch here quickly to 
um, some some rendering exhibits that the, these were provided and prepared um, at, at the request of the board. And as Mark mentioned, some discussion that we had with the public and public comment, where you had asked the the applicant to prepare a visualization of of what this project would be anticipated to look like from specific vantage points. And so what, what has been prepared and what I'll walk you through this evening are, are three specific views. The one that you're looking at right now, as is indicated on the bottom of the screen, this is the front view from the intersection of five and 10 and Mill Village Road. So, so we're looking at, at the front of the building, you can see uh, how this is generally positioned on the property and, and how some of the architectural enhancements would, would be expected to appear from, from this intersection. And, and just as, as noted by Mr. Turner, um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, the, the manner in which that the residential property shows in the back right, um, its, its relation in size and the like uh, is all computer generated based upon actual information as to size and distance. Correct, so and that's a good point, Mark. And just to kind of clarify that further, we, we had worked in conjunction with the project architect who prepared these visualizations and put them into using our design files to then create this and superimpose their architecture onto, onto the design. So these are computer generated images. And, and while they're not, they, they, they're probably a very, very good approximation. I don't know that they're an exact approximation, but they're very, very close. And, and, our, and again, are computer generated. So there, we're not kind of eyeballing it. There, there's a lot of thought and care um, by the project architect in the preparation of these exhibits. Any questions on this particular vantage point before I go to uh, another one? Any questions by board members? If we can ask, uh, uh, can I, I, I see that there are no trees. Uh, and hold that, on, question, question by Mrs. Taberski. I'm sorry, I, may I be a recognized? Yep. Yes, you may. <clears throat> so I, I know that the uh, curtilage in front of the, uh, front of the facility probably you might know better than I, 50 feet, 60, something like that, is state-owned land that was cleared by the owner and then there was an order for a replanting of trees. This shows a well-manicured lawn on state land. Um, is it uh, the applicant's position that they can assume ownership of that state land, ownership and control, and and take down trees and plant shrubbery and mow lawns and that sort of thing? No, that is not the applicant's position. So I, as I've mentioned, this is an approximation. The, the, the vegetation that you know, we understand has been transplanted or replanted in the right of way by the owner that doesn't show up in this rendering. The landscaping features that you're seeing on, on this particular image are representative of plantings that are proposed on the physical property and not within the right of way that is controlled by mass dot the existing plantings that the owner has replaced are intended to remain and the expectation and the intent is not that those are going to be removed as part of the construction of this project so my follow-up question is how does this building in terms of one and i was the one who made these issues uh at the last hearing i was interested in how the size of this building related to the dinosaur facility that's just to the north of it did it overwhelm it in size or was it consistent relatively do you have a relationship with the most northerly building next to it uh, by, by a general approximation, this, this building is larger. I don't know the exact square footage of, of the dinosaur uh, stone facility or, or fossil facility. Uh, this, this facility is larger though. To what extent, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm concerned whether it overwhelms it by putting a massive Walmart next to maybe a little hot dog stand. Uh, I mean, I know that's I not the that's same analogy. Really but a fair comparison. I understand no, you're it's not a fair comparison, but I can't. Okay. Right. If, if, if it, if it, to, to that point, we'd be happy to provide you with a, a more definitive um, estimation there. Thank you. What, why don't we go to the next slide, Austin? Sure. Yep. The next vantage point that we'll take a look at, this is 
as you as you would be coming up Mill Village Road with the intersection of, of Plain. So you'd be along as you'd be facing the front of the building. You'd be looking at the the left or, or rear corner of it. So this is as you're kind of coming up Mill Village, and then you'd be approaching the the residential neighborhood, which you can see just to the back and left of this particular image. So what you can see here is this is where the screen fence would begin and there's going to be some additional plantings that are going to be in front of that fence and it gives you a context of, of what you you may be seeing or visualizing as you would be on Mill Village Road and starting to round around the corner on the side of the of the building. Any comments by board members? Uh, Bernie, I got a question. Yes. That, Mr. That, Decker. That fire hydrant is, is, is already in existence there, correct? That's correct. And wasn't that where the standpipe used to be for the farmers to fill their uh, uh, potato sprayers and stuff uh, 25, 30 years ago? That is correct. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. I guess, Mr. Austin, you could continue. Okay, any particular questions on this vantage point? I'd like me to go to the next one. I think we don't have any, we can proceed. So the next one we're taking a look at here is, this is to the rear. Again, you, you've, you've kind of rounded the corner and you're on, on Mill Village, looking towards the rear of the facility. So you can see kind of in the background, uh, Ken, there's, there's this, this brown, band and that's the screening fence which at one point we had actually put closer up along this vegetation which you're seeing here this landscaping is proposed um, at the request of the board and, and through some discussion received as part of the public comment process that fence was actually moved further interior to the property and more proximate to the building um, the landscaping that we had proposed remained the same so so we are continuing to landscape along along the outer property boundary and to provide some visual attenuation in addition to the architectural enhancements that have been incorporated as, as part of this project and through our discussions with the board. Any questions by board members? Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized? Yes, John Staberski, please. Um, did you do any renderings uh, relative to the residences across the street? I think there's at least two or three uh, residences that are in close proximity on the uh, easterly side of routes five and 10. You're referring to the, well, I, I, have a, I think there's a legend in the corner. So just so I'm clear, I'm answering the question. Proper. Are you referring to this corner, if you can see my cursor up, up on the plain road side, or are you referring to where the red arrow is? Uh, no, it's actually on the other side, uh, directly opposite your facility uh, from Greenfield Road or 5 and 10. There's one residence that's right on the corner of North Main Street. And then there are a couple of uh, residences across the street as you move northerly on Greenfield Road. And I was kind of wondering how a uh, commercial facility would interplay with the residential aspect of, of those abutters? Uh, we haven't done that vantage point specifically, but again, you know, in, in the spirit of continuing to work with the board and the community, if that vantage point was of particular importance to the board, we'd be happy to prepare it. Well, I certainly believe it really, when we're putting a, 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 a commercial structure in the middle of where there are residences that are abutters in close proximity, that were there probably before a commercial zone was formed because those houses have been there long, long time. Uh, just, just as a, a further point of clarification and not, I don't know that this answers the question specifically, but just to clarify where this vantage point's being taken from. You know, this, this red arrow here is kind of where, where the architect had, had put this vantage point, but more, I think more accurately, this vantage point would probably be back almost at the confluence of this property boundary where the triangle is. So. This comes around the corner. I don't know that that picks up the specific point that you're referring to, which I think is more, more in this intersection on this side of the road here. And again, if, if the board's pleasure, we can put that together. You know, I you don't have the if you had the other map, I could kind of show you, uh, but I, I'm not seeing your red arrow either. So if uh, if 
if you look on the other side of the street, well, actually there's one house that is obliterated by the P in Plain Road. Uh, there's a there. Yep, there's a house there. Yeah. And, then, and then if you go northerly, there's two more houses. Uh, those two houses right there. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I would consider those immediate neighbors of this new facility and um, you know and i think it's fair to see how that relates in terms of the the facility in terms of evaluating the neighborhood characteristic criteria that we need to make a judgment on so with respect to the 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 first building which is just located just above the p in plain road you know we had done a vantage point which is more close to the site which is this this view here this is at the intersection of mill village and five and ten i would suggest that th this view is probably representative of that in fact you could say you know, that particular residence is further away and therefore the scale of this would would, would appear smaller um so i i would suggest that this this view would give you a, a reasonable context even if perhaps from that specific location an exaggerated view um, to to your point about these two residences here, if the board felt strongly about wanting to include that, we, we could we could prepare that for you. Mr. Chairman, can I be recognized? Yeah, I recognize this Mr. Decker, please. Oh, not me. Adam. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, like I said, I'm not getting it. I, I can't tell you that I'm not getting any responses. So, uh, Jennifer, you're gonna have to tell me who's out there because I'm I'm getting nothing we're, here. We're we're not raising our hands, Bernie. We're just uh, unmuting and asking you. Okay, so up at the top of the screen, Bernie, is options for you to see who's speaking. It's just it's called speaker view. Uh, nope. Top right. No, nope. all I nope. see is tools, sign in, and comments. Okay, if um. If, yeah, can we interrupt and come in and please? Help you? Like I said, I'm blind. I'm, I'm I'm shooting in the dark here. I have no idea what's I going on here. I can continue with my comment, and then okay, I'll be right Casey there. Can give you a hand. Yep. Um, I just want to ask Mr. Turner, uh, as far as his um, vegetation, um, are those renderings at mature, or are those uh, renderings to be, you know, at planting? Um, your vegetation you to this be, one specifically, correct? What's that? You were, I'm just, I just put up an image just to make sure I'm answering your specific question. You're referring to the rear rendering, I assume, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it definitely speaks to what we asked for um, back in January about, you know, making sure your your plantings were mature. I don't know if that's something that specifically, you know, the size of the bushes that you were planting, planning on putting in there. Um, I mean, in this picture, and I know it's not to scale, but it's as close as you thought you guys could get they seem to be you know over eight feet if you that's an eight foot fence um is that think, is that the size plantings you guys are going with um i think these would probably be a, a bit shorter at their immediate planting but the intent and what we've talked about with the board was to put in you know vegetation that would be a bit more mature than you would customarily do because we understood both from the board and from the public that you know, screening was important, hence, hence the, the way this landscaping plan has come to form. There's a certain level of maturity that these have reached, but I don't know that it's appreciably different from what would be planted, but there might be a year or two of growth in this image just to, to contextualize what it would look like you know, at completion and, and with some level of operation under its belt. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. In, in that regard, what we can provide, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and to the member, uh, is a written response as to the um, both species and um, uh, average uh, size that they will be at the time of planting. Okay, please, Mr. Dunning, if you're going to make comments, that's okay, but re tell us who you are, because I don't think all people are zooming in. They're, I think some are just hearing uh, the voices, so okay. they can't they can't tell who it is. So if you're, if you're going to speak, just please tell us who you are, So because I've heard comments that, well, we don't know who you are. So... Uh, yeah, I, I know this is difficult, but, but no worries. Uh, would help be helpful at least, I guess. But thank no, you. No worries. I, I just wrote down my name, so I won't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, are we finished with that part, Mr. Donahue? 
we have. Mr. Turner, have you completed your uh, visuals? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. With respect to that particular topic, yes, sir, I have. Okay. Uh, board members, any questions on these um, viewings? Anybody have any questions? Oh, I, I think the, the front design of the Mr. building. Mr. Decker, Mr. I Decker, think, question. Not really a question, but I think that the building facing um, Route 5 and 10 looks like a nice red tobacco barn from the front. And there used to be a barn within about four or 500 feet of that that was red. And about the same size. Okay. Thank uh, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Decker. Anybody else for comments? Yeah, Mr. Sadowski, I can be, or can I be recognized again? Yes, please. Uh, Adam Sokolowski, recognized, please. Uh, back to your first uh, picture of the front view there. I have uh, two, two signage questions. Um, it says, because uh, this is just would say Dollar General instead of retail store on these, and they're white. That's what you're going with here. I think it would be branded to be tenant specific. Again, Austin Turner, sorry, just for those who may not be visualizing. It would be tenant specific. In this case, you know, there has been discussion about, about Dollar General, so that would be brand specific. Um, and then with respect to uh, a monument sign, you can kind of see it in the background far away because the right of way is, is, is quite wide. There is the monument sign on the left of the image as well. Yeah, I know in the Cumberland Farms process, because we had some uh, some specific stuff on signs. Um, you know, we had them, uh, and I wasn't on the board at the time, not put the green that was kind of uh, shockish on top of their um, gas pumps because the white is a little bit flatter and it's a little less uh, intrusive, but not, not a huge issue, but just something to keep in mind just because, you know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, at the end of the day that if you're showing white signs and white letters, then, then that's what it that's what it, it comes out. If we were to grant a special permit, it should be you know what we're seeing, uh, not something different at the time of construction. Um, but I do uh, like the the changes that you've made, the enhancements and the um, you know the upgrades to to accommodate some of the uh, requests that we've made. That that's all I have, uh, Mr. Sadowski. If we want to move on. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sokolowski. Okay, um, Mr. Mr. Sadowski, may yes, I? Yes, uh, John Staberski recognized. Uh, would it be possible for you when we were doing the other renderings that I requested to show this particular corner uh, uh, with the trees that are in the state curtilage? And uh, and uh, is there going to be a represent? Is there a, a an ironclad representation that there will be nothing done with the state land by uh, by the applicant or by any subsequent owner? We're not proposing any work in that right away. I think to the extent that we can commit to not doing anything beyond what would be required to accommodate the driveway connection, um, then we're not intending to do anything and. To that effect, I, I believe the applicant could, could commit to not removing any of that existing vegetation. Um, your, your first question, uh, first question. Your first question about the actual photographs. Yeah, uh, just the, the rendering to show to make it look accurate. Because if you're from that vantage point, you're not going to see grass, you're not going to see flowers, you're not going to see bushes, you're going to see, you know, a lightly forested 50 foot strip which is what is actually going to be present there. And I think that's a more accurate uh, rendition. And well, to, your, to, your, to answer that question, again, Austin Turner, we can work with the architect to get uh, more recent photography for this. I know that was recently completed, but we'll, we'll work on that for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Donahue, would you continue please? I, th I think in, in the interest of time and given the number of comments in the chat, the, those categories are the significant portion uh, of the new material uh, that was responsive to both the board's questions and uh, questions of the public in the January 23rd meeting. We reviewed originally and our application includes 
uh, fairly detailed um, okay, so language with regard to the social, economic, and community needs that are met by the development. Oh, okay, there is no additional new information. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, we're glad to uh, yield the floor uh, at this point to either the board or uh, your will, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think we need to take a five minute break, please, so we can get organized, so I can get organized here. It hey, would Mr. Really be a, I'd really appreciate it, board members, if we could take just a five minute break. Mr. Chairman, just a point of order. Yes. Uh, somebody does not have their mic muted. So when Mr. Donahue was speaking, we heard in the background some voices mumbling that was kind of interfering with what, what he heard. So just for folks who are on mic to, when you're not speaking. Yeah, that that was actually uh, Casey trying to help Bernie, so that's why he's taking a five-minute break. Okay, so, I heard. Uh, okay. I, you know, it was, uh, I must yeah. apologize. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Sorry, John. Okay, that's so good. let's take a let's take a, let's reconvene at six o'clock. Okay. okay. Bathroom break, please. Thank you. Okay. So. Okay. Right. okay we're going to open the meeting back up, please. Mr. Uh, Adam is here. We have everybody here. Mr. Donahue is here. Okay, Mr. Donahue, any more comments that you'd like to make to the to board and to the public? Are you finished with what you're um, on mute? Am I doing it? Oh, here we go. Can you hear me? I can. Mark? Yep. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mark Donahue, um, yes, uh, in the interest of, of time and expediency, um, that's uh, what we wanted to do was make it clear what we provided since January to the board and which is in the public record. Um, I think we've done that. With, there's plenty more we can say, but um, in the interest of time, it might be better for you to either address with board questions or we're glad to respond to any questions or comments from the public. Okay. Uh, it this time, I think what I'll do is, uh, board members, do we have any more questions from Mr. Donahue before we proceed with the public comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sokolowski here. I, I was able to do a little, uh, with a little bit of assistance uh, on my question regarding those plantings. We have clear and specific language in the bylaw. Okay. So uh, any of those plantings will have to be uh, eight feet and that's uh, section 3300. And there's also a uh, significant language that they would, any applicant would have to follow um, if a special permit was granted in regards to signage. Okay. Mr. Decker, any questions? No, I think they pretty much answered our, a lot of our concerns. There may be more things that will get flushed out, but you know, I think they've done a pretty good job of trying to get us the information we wanted. And uh, hopefully at some point in time, we can move on. But uh, that's the only thing I'm concerned is uh, North Main Street doesn't have sidewalks once you get by Jackson Road. So if you're talking about crosswalks and what have you over on over there, you got to put a crosswalk across that railroad bridge and you got to put a sidewalk all the way up through to make to get to it. Okay. So somebody's going to have to back their crosswalks and, you know, it, somebody's going to have to pay for put a put quite a bit of sidewalks in to, to get it, probably a thousand foot of sidewalks. Okay, Mrs. Tabreski, any more questions for them while they're here? Um, no, uh, maybe just, this is a more of a general question. Maybe I'll save it for later. Maybe Mr. Donahue can answer it. Why is there a need, and it's a general question, to, to come before this board for a special permit rather than comply with the town's zoning bylaws and build a commercial establishment in accordance with our bylaws. Well, just, just to uh, Mr. Dunn, name right. please. Thank you. <laughs> Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant uh, 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 to the member. Uh, just to clarify, um, the, the uh, proposed use is permitted by the bylaw. It Correct. is permitted on the grant ah. special permit. Um, there is a matter of right, one could have a building up to 4,000 square feet. Unfortunately, for a successful retail operation, as envisioned by the applicant, uh, 4,000 square feet uh, of uh, area is insufficient. So if, uh, if this board denied your application for a special permit, the applicant would not build a 4,000 square foot facility there? I have not marked on to you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, I have not reviewed uh, what my client would do with conjecture as to what this board would do. Uh, we would expect the board will follow the bylaw and grant the special permit. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Alex, any questions uh, from you? No, I don't have any questions. Uh, everything seems pretty straightforward. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to the applicant for um, addressing the uh, questions, comments, and concerns from the public and the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Potter, are you present here? Mr. Potter? Mr. Potter, any questions? Yes, I'm here. No, no questions. Okay, because I'd like to, you know, uh, the uh, alternates, I would really like you to participate because we're going to, you know, we're going to have to have an alternate. So I want you to be free to ask questions so that uh, if you're the one that's going to be the alternate, you need to be able to ask the questions or feel comfortable in the position. Okay, uh, if we have no more questions from the board, we're going to proceed with the um, questions with the hands up. And I think Jennifer is going to um, proceed with that. We're going to ask that everyone limit themselves to three minutes. Uh, we ask that do not repeat your uh, a question that's been asked. So let's not go back over the same topic and be repetitive. And I will notify people when their three minutes are up. And we expect people to um, respect that three minute rule and give someone else a chance to speak. Okay, um, Jennifer. Okay, I'm about to do it. Ready? I'm allowing Susan to talk. Susan, go ahead. Hello, my name is Susan Half. I'm in a butter and I live at 11B Mill Village Road. Um, several of the abutters have gotten together and uh, we have a number of comments we would like to make. However, rather than having you listen to my voice go on and on, uh, we would like to divide those comments up and two other abutters would like to speak. One is Gina Cowley and the other Elissa uh, Clement. And um, we could have one of those two go if they would like to go now. We thank you very much for the opportunity to hear the abutter's voice. Is uh, either Gina or Elissa available? Um, hi, you have to, um, it's only one person to chat at a time. So do right. you have any questions? I do, but I mine are more of a, a, a cleanup of our comments. Um, well, then we have to end you and we have to go to them, so. Okay, and would I be able to get back in? You have to raise your hand again after everybody else talks. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay. Can you stop it, uh, Adam? Thank you. We're, we've stopped. Go ahead. Okay. Next question, please. Okay. Um, Adam, stop sharing your screen because I can't get back to the hand. Okay. Okay. So now we have um, Lori. This one, yeah, Bushada. Hi. So um, there's a lot of things that I have uh, issues with. But, um, first, I would like to talk about the drawing, the rendering. Um, it, it says retail store on the building itself. Is that the extent to which we'll see signage? And do we have um, an agreement that the signage will be white against a red background like that? Or is it gonna be the typical glaring yellow signage? And is there any other signage in addition to on the building? That's my first question. Who are you, Mr. Chairman? Um, I don't have a comment. Maybe one of the board members does, but I'm not going to comment on these questions. We'll, we're going to we're going to document them and we'll we'll think about them. But um, we're not going to get into discussion with the public about what their concerns are right now. We'll take a look at it when we oh, go into discussion. I, I'm sorry. I thought I was asking um, the architect about if the if the signage is limited to what they're showing us in the rendering there. 
And then, so I'm watching the timer. I also wanna ask about truck traffic because we know that there is more than the Dollar General delivery. There are deliveries by many different vendors that come and I am concerned about a backup of truck tra traffic on um, Route 5. So north of the site, there is not a shoulder there. There is not a place for trucks to wait to be able to get into the narrow driveway when other cars are entering or exiting. So I would like those concerns to be addressed. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Donnie, would you like to comment on those or? Um... Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. Um, with regard to the signage, the, there is a sign on the building, which will be, as Mr. Turner indicated, branded by the uh, user of the building. Uh, and often the branding includes a certain color selection that they have. Your bylaw has uh, specific requirements with regard to signage uh, in the district in section 3221, uh, and we'll meet that requirement. Uh, Mr. Turner also pointed out on the renderings, uh, the location of the so-called monument sign, uh, which will also be, be of a branding nature uh, for the single tenant to go uh, in that location. Uh, with regard to the uh, truck traffic, I think that means uh, that, that the individual is speaking of delivery trucks. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Kelly to speak about the deliveries that uh, this type of store receives, how often they're received, and the period of time that they're received. With your permission, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kelly, please recognize, board recognize Mr. Kelly. Right, well, I mean, they, they're going to get a variety of deliveries, certainly throughout the day. Um, you know, my understanding is that typically they only get one, you know, one box truck at, at most of a given day. Most of these deliveries are coming in from smaller panel trucks. You know, um, it actually, it's typically less than that. Um, but but you, you don't see tractor trailers servicing these stores as often as you see the smaller, you know, what we call SU-30 trucks. It's a, it's a you know, it's, a, it's not an extended trailer. It's a smaller vehicle. Um, I believe Dollar General, and I'll, I'll let the client um, respond to this, it's once per week we'll get the large, you know, delivery vehicles. And we've sized the driveway in such a way to ensure that those vehicles can, can enter and exit the site without any issues in terms of impacting traffic on Route 5 and 10. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, board members, any questions, comments? None. Okay, next question, please, Ms. Garner. Hi, and it's Gannett, sorry. Uh, okay, so we're gonna ask Alyssa Clement. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, Elissa Clement, Evans Lane. I'm an abutter to the proposed development and I'm extremely concerned about the detriment that this development will bring to our neighborhood. Um, I am speaking in conjunction with Sue and Gina representing the interests of the group of abutters here. Um, and specifically, we have 11 requests of the developer um, that we believe should be addressed by the applicant prior to a firm decision by the board. I will just cover a few of those and they will cover the others. Um, the first one is a new traffic study that monitors traffic in the fall or uh, during school and tourist periods and looks beyond vehicle counting to address public safety. Um, the, draft, the developer's traffic study was not done during a normal school year as requested by the planning board. Uh, the applicant had ample time to conduct this traffic study and could have easily followed the planning board's instruction to conduct it um, during September by waiting a couple weeks instead of conducting it in August. However, now during the pandemic, this intersection has completely changed. Many of us who used to travel through that intersection several times a day now rarely use it. Um, therefore, the um, an accurate assessment of traffic cannot be made now. No substitution is acceptable until post pandemic. Huh. Number two, a road safety audit on this intersection. I apologize for talking so quickly. I just, I know you want me to be quick. Um, a road safety audit on this intersection requested by MassDOT District 2 on the application for a highway access permit. The third one is a comprehensive study of truck traffic flow around and within the proposed parking areas that accounts for all delivery vehicles from multiple distributors. And finally, compliance with the Green Dot standards, which state 
private developers that access state-owned highway are required to design, build, and operate their projects in a manner that encourages and seeks to increase walking, bicycling, and transit use. Um, as members of the ZBA representing the best interests of Deerfield residents, we respectfully request that you obtain all the information that has been requested from this developer, then carefully weigh all the detriments that granting this special permit would have for our future. Thank you for hearing our concerns and thank you for your time given to this. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, please. Uh, next, uh, any comments by board members? No. Okay, we'll continue then. So we don't, we'll, with uh, another uh, hand up, I guess is what you want to call it. Okay, this is a uh, Judith. Cundall. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Judith Cundall, 22 Lee Road. Like many residents that are participating in this hearing, the most critical concern for me is the drive through that intersection at Mill Village and routes five and 10. And that's what I focused on. I sent the board a letter as to why they should not grant the special permit until they have in hand the state permits with all the improvements to that road. Um, after the January hearing, I was quite surprised to hear the applicant's attorney, Mr. Donahue, say two things. One, that the state would not issue a permit without unless the town had issued all of its permits first. And well, second, cover my items second that that, um, first, I can hear Alyssa, sorry. Time and secondly, I that they were working with the state. Try again. After that hearing, I went down to the DOT office and I had checked it in with them right before that hearing. I went down to the DOT office and they told me that it's not true. They can issue a driveway permit and, and before the town has issued all of its permits. And there was no one in the District 2 office who was speaking with the applicant. So I would like, I think it makes it easier than trying to think that everything they're telling you is true, is to make sure they actually give you a uh, permit or proof that the state is going to grant them a permit before you act on the uh, special permit. There's another permit that they need. Their drainage needs a, a permit from the state, a non-vehicular vehicular access permit. And then there's no indication on where they stand on that. And finally, um, I take exception to Mr. Donahue's implication that they're allowed to get a special permit by right. And that's not what the law is in the Deerfield bylaw it clearly says no one has a right to a special permit. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, next person, please. I'm allowing Tolly. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes we can. Wonderful. Before you start the clock, um, Jennifer, I just wanted to quickly check in that um, they presented quite a bit of new information here, and um, I guess I will just plan um, to raise my hand again to address other things. And I see my clock is already running. Okay, Tolly Stark, 121 Keats Road. Um, I'm going to address the traffic to begin with. Um, first of all, I would like to note that um, I have heard that um, Sean Kelly is basically stated now on the record that they do not feel that um, they want to put the expense towards a new RSA because they would rather spend it in other places. Although they have built um, their new proposed infrastructure off a of very old RSA that does not take into account the newer businesses at that intersection like Atlas Farms and probably Gina's Dinosaur Shop as well, which is in a butter. Um, and I would also like to you know, let you guys know that um, we also heard Sean Kelly speak about how this is a rare, rare, relatively safe intersection um, compared with intersections that don't have signals. Now that is a certain benchmarker that he's assigning to this, but that does not represent that this intersection is safe. It is actually a mass DOT 
top crash location. And Jennifer, if you could pause the clock and please pull up the picture that I had sent you. I can uh, show the picture after the time is run out, Tali, because I can't share my screen when this is going because I'm not managing the clock. Okay, well, I'll ask for a few extra seconds then. Um, so I just want to point that out to the board, how misleading that actually is with this new proposed traffic infrastructure. Would this make it possibly um, a little bit safer? Yes. But if someone gave me a penny, I'm, I'm a penny richer, but am I then rich? No. So it's a bare minimum that they're actually offering us. Um, and I would also like um, to point out as well that it still does not um, coincide with the green dot standard. And that is mandatory through the state. There's not enough sidewalks. There's um, no advocacy for public transportation. There's minimal bike lanes. And I would also like to know, um, with those turning lanes, how many cars can fit in those turning lanes at the same time to where you won't have traffic backed up um, onto either end? So that's a question if the board could please note that. And I will, um, I will stop now and I will raise my hand again to address the character. Thank you. Uh, questions by any board members, comments? Okay, then uh, Jen, let's move on um, to the Jen, next uh, Jennifer, person, please. Jen, you can move on, yeah. please. Yeah, she wanted me to share the picture. You don't oh, want me to show the picture? Yes, share, share the picture. Okay. Uh, Hmm. Jen, sorry. let's move on. I'm, I'm Just sorry. Move, let's move on. Please. Sorry about that. I will try to That's get it okay. Up. Okay. So now um, this is Darren Gray. Oh, uh, first of all, thanks to all the board members for volunteering uh, for our town. Greatly appreciate it. Um, quick comment. I understand the confusion by the applicant. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Day, where are you from and what oh, street? Sorry, please? Darren. Sorry, Darren Gray, 20 Captain Lathrop Drive. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. There we go. Second, I see the confusion regarding the neighborhood. I mean, this parcel once upon a time was very consistent with you know the gateway corridor under Franklin County, South Deerfield. As you see along there, all of our major developments, you know, Gumby's, Yankee Candle, Channing Beat, the industrial sites, they've all kept their trees up front. They maintain that corridor with the trees coming down on this parcel. Now it's really inconsistent. And there is confusion about what part of the corridor it belongs to. And it should be part of the gateway into our town still. But um, so I would just ask that the board please uh, Consider that, consider the history of this parcel, that it has always been consistent with that character of the South Deerfield gateway corridor into our town and county, um, that they should try to match that however they can. So I'm, I'm just happy to hear the request to have the uh, elevation views updated to include the current state of things. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Jen, you can start the next person, please. This is Lily Dwight. Lily, sorry. Lily, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's actually Lily. Thank you. My name is Lily Dwight. I live at 45 South Mill River Road in South Deerfield. I want to clearly state for the record that I find a three minute limit on the public to be arbitrary and patently unfair and really against the democratic principles of our small town management. The purpose of the zoning bylaws is to protect our community and our community's character and I feel strongly, as you might have guessed, that we should have a large voice in this instead of giving unlimited time to applicants who refuse to comply with multiple requests over the last two years for basic information and who give us misleading, misrepresenting images that are clearly not to scale and claim that they are. But for me, the big thing is poop. They claim to have a septic design. Sorry, I'm on a Zoom and meeting for the... I'm sorry, be quiet. On page six of the design, they claim to 
see, there's a whole bunch of stuff about C septic design plans, C septic design plans. Well, first of all, it looks like that, that <clears throat> effluent goes into something that is supposedly a detention pond, which is going to go right into Bloody Brook because there is a pipe that goes straight from the end of their new driveway northward into Bloody Brook, just so you know. But also, I emailed the town and there are no septic designs on the record. So where, where are the septic designs? Where is everything that these people promised? Where are the specs for their monument sign? So anyway, I, I really think that they are trying to step all over us. And to Judy Kundal's point, it is their burden to be a benefit to our community. They have absolutely no rights to come in here and do something that we say isn't proper. If they want to build a 4,000 square foot building, hooray, fine, go for it but to assume that they can do this and ignore our requests for two years. And um, I hope that Mr. Hayes is on because he actually observed the traffic and the trucks going in to Dollar General up in Greenfield and saw them all piling up on the road. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I be uh, recognized? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, questions by, uh, Members, board members, or comments? Uh, um, Mr. Donahue or anybody else from the applicant's side, it had, do you have a septic system uh, design? And if so, could you share it with us? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. I, Mr. Turner can give more detail, but my understanding is we have an approved uh, a septic system plan that was previously submitted to the Board of Health and approved. Um, but I'll let him get into more detail. Certainly, and again, for the record, Austin Turner with Bowler. Um, Mr. Donahue is correct. It, you know, when we were reviewing this project, part of the initial discussion with the planning board, there was a septic system design that was designed and approved by the Board of Health. The, those, those plans, in my understanding, the, the official copies of those plans are available at the town hall. But that's where the official version is kept. And if we had provided the planning board with, with a copy you know, the, the Board of Health approval stamp of those some time ago. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Waldron, yeah. can you hear me? Get off mute, yes. Uh, are those plans available? I believe they are, aren't they? Yeah, they would be, Dick would have them, but uh, I would assume they're available. I thought they were available through the planning board's um, package. Okay. Mr. Chairman. I, 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 I know it was, um, perked and past perked. I'm, I don't, I'm not the Board of Health. I didn't actually see the, the actual plan, but I do know the site perked and the system most likely could have been designed to fit there. Mr. Donahue. Uh, Mark Donahue, uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll, we'll be glad to upload the approval and if the board wants the, the full design plans to the, um, to the Dropbox link that we provided previously. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from board members? We all set on that? Okay, uh, Jen, next talk. Uh, okay, I comment. have yep, Debbie Shriver. Yes, hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. I'm Debbie Shriver. I live at 8 Pocumtuck Drive. And I'm wanting to speak a little bit about the Conservation Commission and the request for determination of applicability, which I believe the applicant has submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and also to the Conservation Commission. And I'm, what I'm requesting is actually that the Zoning Board of Appeals continue this hearing until there have been actions of all kinds. First, on all the outstanding permits, as Ms. Kundal also requested, and also with respect to the Conservation Commission. Um, I recall that the board in January said that you wanted to have all permits in hand before you reached a decision on this development. And one critical component will be what the Conservation Commission does, which as Mr. Donahue pointed out, will only be able to review the request for determin of a determination of applicability that was submitted. Uh, they will only review that at their August 27th meeting. And, uh, and at that time, they will also be reviewing a response to the content of that RDA, which will be presented at that time. And so my request to you is that you continue this 
hearing um, at least until such time as that uh, issue has been acted upon and resolved. There are real wetlands issues. And I have questions also about whether the addition of turn lanes, bike lanes, would move into the state right of way where those wetlands exist and the impacts that they would have. Therefore, it's a very important part of the, of the considerations as you are uh, debating this issue. Um, so that is my request that you continue this and that, um, that you await the uh, disposition of all of the information that will be coming from the Conservation Commission subsequent to their August 27th meeting. Thank you. Um, just a quick comment. The board will consider that. Um, we are a board and we have to decide as a group and we'll take that certainly into consideration when we, uh, when we uh, do our uh, determination. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sadowski, may I yes, address? John Staberski. Mr. Donahue, do you have any uh, problem or opposition to, um, uh, to doing all of the required permitting before we uh, decide on your application? Can he my apologies, Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. Um, yes, we, that, that is unacceptable to the applicant. Um, we, see the issues as, we see the issues as separate and distinct. Um, yeah, we uh, submitted the determination for applicability. It'll go through the process as allowed. Um, if there's a determination, then we'll file an order of conditions, which will be a separate and distinct permit from the special permit. So, no, I, I'm also talking about this, the state uh, DOT, all the other uh, permits you should you need to have in hand before you uh, build. Um, you know we are kind of the, the the last should be the last people to decide to make sure all the other uh, requirements have been met. Do you have you haven't you have obviously have an issue with that? Uh, Mark Donahue, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do. Uh, I, I don't agree with the premise that you should be last. Uh, I think the applicant's entitled to know whether the use is going to be permitted by the town. Uh, when they make the application for it, and that we should submit the information that's required for you to make the necessary findings and for you to make a determination. Mr. Chair, could I be recognized? Yeah, Adam, Adam Sokolowski, please. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think that is impartial. Uh, it's, you know, the building inspector is the, has to make sure everybody's got their ducks in a row. What the conservation committee determines is outside of our peer group, just like stormwater retention and I, I see the comments and I've read all the all the time and effort people put into um, letters that were sent to us and the planning board that this is going to have to go back to the planning board before a building permit can be issued and issues like stormwater retention and the conservation have nothing to do with what's in front of us and we need to move this along uh, in a timely fashion the building permit a permit to proceed won't be granted by Mr. Walden and he's on here until they have all the proper permitting from all of the boards. Um, so I just wanna make sure that everybody in the audience and, and everybody on the board is aware that, that those things are not up for us to debate uh, as far as conservation issues or stormwater runoff or things that are in site plan review. Uh, may I respond? Awesome. Yes, John Sabersky, response. Uh, the, you, you, are, you are right with respect to things that the town controls but there's one particular aspect that the state controls uh, and that's how the intersection will be reconstructed and whether the state is gonna honor those commitments, who's gonna pay for them. Um, and, uh, and we don't have any control over that aspect. I know uh, that, that the applicant has said that they are willing to grant, up, well, they were, will they be willing to have us grant a contingent uh, permit based upon state approvals, but I think we want to see what the state's going to be authorized to do, who's going to pay for it, and if it meets uh, the safety requirements that, that we feel is appropriate, not necessarily what the state feels is appropriate. Uh, board recognizing Mr. Donahue, please. Thank you, Mark Donahue. Um, uh, to the member's question, uh, we would expect a condition of approval. Uh, that there is uh, available prior to the issuance of a building permit and evidence to the building inspector and to your board 
uh, that a uh, permit is issued by DOT consistent with the representations that Mr. Kelly on behalf of the applicant has made as to the improvements in the right of way that, um, that we've represented to occur. Thank you. Any other comments by board members? Okay, Jen, next person, please. Okay, <clears throat> we are now going to hear from Gina Bordono. Let's see, oops, let's see. Okay, she's, I have to promote her to a panelist because she's using an old version of Zoom, so. Are you there? Denise? Oh, Gina, I mean, Gina, can you hear me? All right, I'm gonna move on. Okay, Denise. Denise? Uh, it's actually John Pereski at Denise's computer. Okay, okay. go for it. This is John Pereski at 9 Pecumtuck Drive. Um, first of all, I'd like to state I agree with Lily um, Dwight about not having enough time to talk. I think it's an affront to the democratic process. Uh, I have three questions. One, uh, the, at the beginning of the hearing, it was mentioned that it's a one-story retail establishment. The pictures show, make it look like one story and a pretty large attic. So to me, that's two stories. I just like to, I don't know if that's considered or it matters. Um, the pictures all show, don't show. It was brought up in the January hearing, I believe that, what about propane tanks out front, lawn chairs, things of that nature. The pictures don't show that. So are we, um, are we to assume based on that pictures that there's gonna be no inventory outside the building. Uh, third question is I'm concerned about trucks entering the lot. There's a loading dock there to get to that loading dock and for a truck to back into it, they're gonna to have to make two 90 degree turns. And to do that, I guess they're gonna to have to drive in, take a left into the main parking lot, then back up to the right to the loading dock. And I'm concerned about what that's gonna to do to traffic behind the truck that's entering into the driveway, consumer traffic. Um, I can just see a little chaos there as the truck backs up. And I'd like to know how that's gonna be handled. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, comments from anybody from the board or from uh, Dollar General? Okay, no comments. Let's continue, please. Bernie, so yes. um, we've gone through all the raised hands that haven't spoken. So okay. there are five people that have already spoken. So I'm, we're gonna take those questions now. Okay. Oh, now let me see this. Let me see if what would what would you like to do? Just continue. Oh, I have Phil Hayes. He hasn't spoken. He okay. Just, okay, I'll let him do it. Here he is. This is Phil, Phil Hayes from Fifty Nine North Hillside Road. <clears throat> I'm the one, and not all these board members uh, saw this presentation. Who went up and did kind of an unofficial study on Federal Street in Greenfield of the Dollar General up there. And I sat in the parking lot for quite a period of time. And I'm sure Mr. Kelly is not intentionally misleading us, but I think he's been given bad information. I came and I showed pictures. Uh, I talked about the amount of time I saw trucks there, multiple tractor trailers, not to mention, and I don't know what they're called, those big milk delivery trucks and soda delivery trucks that are, I don't know, two thirds of a tractor trailer coming into the Federal Street parking lot, which is a much bigger parking lot. Oh. and having to wait sometimes in the road parked on Federal Street. And I applied that to this location in the presentation that I made. That parking lot is not big enough for somebody to turn around in it easily. And effectively, it stops being a parking lot if they have to keep those spaces open. If somebody's parked a tractor trailer or any type of truck on the road, 
what happens to those bike lanes? What happens to cars coming from the same direction that that vehicle is facing, having to go around and get pushed toward the middle? The fact is the way Dollar General functions is they get multiple tractor trailer deliveries. That is not true, what Mr. Kelly said. My suggestion would be that this parking lot be completely redesigned, made larger, and as a result of that redesign, revisit whether this makes sense in terms of how much of the, what I believe is wetlands, and how much of the, the total plot would be taken up. Just because it's gotta be safer. You can't have trucks backing up into that road and they have no management of their delivery schedule. They are not in control no, I have to of those trucks get there. So on a regular basis, you can expect what I saw on Federal Street in Greenfield, which is large trucks on Federal Street. And at, in Greenfield, they can make a U-turn in that parking lot. That Federal Street parking lot is very large, um, as long as there aren't trucks in certain positions, and they can turn around. Nothing even close to that is possible here. So I think you have a serious concern. You should have a serious concern there. And finally, Let's stop making comments like move this along. Give the public a chance to speak. Let everybody who wants to talk say what they want to say. And please address these things that are being brought up. Don't just go for expediency. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, do we have any comments from the, uh, our questions from the uh, board members? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have you recognized. Uh, John Staberski, please. Uh, to uh, the applicants, uh, either Mr. Donahue or someone else, uh, would the this particular uh, Dollar General store be on the same uh, truck delivery route as the uh, stores in Greenfield in Northampton? Uh, would we expect to see the same kind of truck traffic for this store as the other ones? Uh, for the record, Chad Brubaker with Liscotti Development. Um, I, I can't speak to whether it will be on the exact same truck delivery schedule. I can tell you that, um, you know, for a, for a 9,100 square foot retail store, it's not a 100,000 square foot Walmart where you have trucks coming in on a regular basis. Um, most stores have one large delivery a week, you know, maybe two, depending on the volume of the store. Um, in addition to that, they have smaller, you know, bread trucks, Coca-Cola trucks, uh, milk truck. So, um, you know, they have a very sophisticated network of deliveries. So, um, you know, I can tell you that of all the stores that they manage, you know, safety is, is certainly an issue at, at all locations and something that's, that's weighed very heavily um, on their behalf and, and in the planning of the store. So, um, can't speak to the exact, you know, which truck, if the truck's going to go from Deerfield to Greenfield to where, but, you know, it'd be on a similar schedule that all of their stores are on. Would you, would you expect the same sort of traffic to occur at the Deerfield store as it does the Greenfield store? In other words, does it have the same square footage? Uh, would you, uh, we need to have a kind of a point of reference is what I'm trying to look for. Yeah, I, I, I was not involved in the, in the Greenfield store. I don't know the exact square footage. I know the prototypes, uh, you know, it's a pretty standard 9,100 square foot stores is the standard prototype. So, um, you know, they're all within a couple hundred square feet of each other typically. So. Um, but but every store and every you know market's a little bit different in terms of of inventory and, and volume. So um, you know it, it just because you know if there's truck traffic in an area too as, as customers, I mean it doesn't mean that you know every every truck that's coming there is a Dollar General delivery truck. So thank you. Uh, board, Mr. Donahue, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark Donahue. What I I would ask um, uh, maybe Mr. Kelly who has a lot of experience in traffic assessment and studies with regard to various types of retail uh, to speak both of his experience and some of the professional documentation as to deliveries for a retail store of 91 on 9,300 square feet. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Right, again, uh, Sean Kelly with Benass Associates. And I think, I think Chad hit it in the head. I mean, typically when we're designing loading facilities to accommodate multiple tractor trailers at the same time, you know, we're looking at you know Walmart, Target, hundred thousand square foot big box using. When we were into the you know the ten thousand square foot box type, is this you know whether it's a Dollar General or some instances you'll see a you know a CVS Greens things of this variety. You, you're typically seeing you know one tractor trailer delivery a day, you know or less. You're not typically seeing more than one in a given day. 
I mean, you're going to get your bread deliveries, you're going to get your milk deliveries, the perishable items, things of that nature. And those typically, again, come in smaller trucks. They're not um, tractor trailers. So we've, you know, we've looked at this to design the driveway in such a way to accommodate um, the largest vehicle that we expect, but we're not expecting to have, you know, even one a day, let alone, you know, multiple at the same time. Uh, that, that level of design, that level of, you know, accommodation for delivery vehicles of that size, you typically see it when you're looking at big box developments that are, you know, 12 times the size of this store. We simply, you know, it's a small store, relatively speaking, 9,600 over 9,000 square feet. It's, it's not, um, you know, it, it, you don't typically see that level of activity in a store of this size. If, if I could just add, Mr. Chairman, Mark Donahue. Yes, Mark Donahue. Um, I, I would also refer you to the peer review uh, done by Ty and Bond of the Vanessa and Associates Traffic Impact Study, uh, which did not uh, uh, challenge or criticize the truck schedules as set forth in that report in any fashion, rather found they were consistent with professional standards. Mr. Sadowski may be recognized. Yes, Mrs. Tversky. Uh, Mr. Kelly, would you be uh, kind enough to uh, show us in a drawing if we had a tractor trailer truck and then one other milk truck or Coca-Cola truck, uh, a smaller truck, both kind of being in that in the parking lot and trying to make a delivery at the same time and what it would look like at that intersection? Is that something you could draw for us on, a, uh, uh, on the plan? Um, some prepare for a subsequent meeting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, to, so we could so we could see what it looked like if two trucks happened to arrive at the same time, a big one and a small one, uh, yeah, okay. with customers there, and and how what would happen at that that site? Uh, I would think of something we could put together for you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? What'd you say? We all set. Okay. Um, Jen, are we up? What are we on to now? So we have hands um, up, or oh no, it was, yeah. uh, written comments. Is that what it was? No, we still have uh, people wanting to make comment again that have made a comment already. So okay, um, Mr. Stavarsky, I'd like to be recognized. Oh, oh, okay, go uh, go ahead, Adam. But I have something to say. But go ahead, uh, Adam Sakalowski. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to uh, downplay anybody's comments, but. I have a pretty clear memory of what was said by a lot of the people that are saying the same thing again back in January. And I appreciate your comments. And I understand that you do not want this. I understand that this is not the perfect fit for our community. And I understand that, but you have to realize that we've taken comments since January. The ZBA is taking comments on this topic and the public has, con con <clears throat> excuse me, has continually availed themselves of that access. So um, just, just because you want to say it again now doesn't mean we don't remember we hear you i hear you if this what the problem is that we have to treat these people fairly even though they're really not liked by a lot of people that are being very vocal and that's where i stand on this so i appreciate the effort i appreciate the letters and i do remember them all i'm not trying to speed up the process as far as any faster we've been working on this since january or even before that. Thank you, Mr. Sadowski. All right. Um, Bernie Sadowski, Chairman. Um, I'm going to warn people, if I hear any more de detrimental comments towards this board, I'm going to cut you off. This is not the place to be demeaning in our comments to this board. We are all volunteers here. We spent a lot of time. We're not getting paid for it. Uh, I got a pile of papers about 10 feet high in my, in my house, and I don't appreciate people who are commenting on our, our, our comments and what we're doing. We're doing this because we think it's a uh, part of our community. And if you start being negative, I'm gonna cut you off and you will not repeat. You will not ask another question. Now, I hope I make myself clear because that's not gonna be tolerated here. This is not the place for it. We are to be tolerant of everyone's opinion. Do you hear anybody say anything negative? Yeah. Yeah. Does everyone understand that? Thank you. Continue, please. Okay, so Susan Half. Susan? Yes, okay. Um, I'd like to repeat one thing, and that is thank you to the board. I started with that before, and we do appreciate the effort, the the many hours you put into all of these meetings. 
my comments, which I was passed on the first time around, uh, have to do with some of the renderings that I've just just saw yesterday for the first time. Um, now, there's uh, one thing that I found was there is a uh, pie-shaped piece uh, at the top of the rendering to the back, which is labeled grass. And I'd like to know who is going to maintain that grass. Uh, on the Mill Village side of your rendering, there is a hydrant. There's another voice in here. No plan uh, and no fee have been paid. I'm sorry, there's another voice here. There's Mill Village side, there's a hydrant shown by the wall and the wall around the wall around the building please mute yep. for a second i can't i can't hear you somebody has their her, her their their phone on not or their on their computer right. not on mute so uh someone's talking over you and right i'm sorry i i apologize for no, that no, it's not your fault it somebody else's um, on the rendering of the um, back of the, the store, there is a pie-shaped piece labeled grass. I want to know who is going to maintain that, and are we assured that it's not going to turn into a jungle because uh, nobody's looking at it. It's on the other side of the fence. On the Mill Village side of your rendering, there is a fence by the hydrant the fence runs between the hydrant and the building. I don't think the fire department would like that. What are they planning to do? Is there, are they going to shorten that, that fence and thereby uh, more expose the building? Um, then where the, uh, where the street is being made wider, Yesterday, when I was looking, it appeared that just from the sketches I saw, that the wider part of the road is going to intrude on the state right of way. Another thing, if they move their driveway further to the north, what is going to happen to the trees that are there now? And are they going to replant the trees? some trees where the drive current driveway is how close are they going to come to the rock shop um are they will their their uh curb interfere with the lot next to the rock shop where visitors to the rock shop for kids having parties where cars park uh, i see i'm running out of time so i guess that's all i get Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for your, your comments, ma'am. Jen, uh, the next uh, caller, please. And, uh, I'm sorry, comments by the board? Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Jen, go ahead. Tolly. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Tolly Stark, 121 Keats Road. I just wanted to address some of the things that came up as the applicant explained more around the character in the neighborhood. I just wanted to point out that using the entire corridor as the neighborhood um, seems uh, like a rather arbitrary thing to do. I can't imagine that people all the way in South Deerfield would come down where I am near the Greenfield line and call that their neighborhood. Um, I also would like to um, point out to the board that the visualizations that the um, applicants have presented to us um, showing the aesthetic of the building, but not really showing the proper scale of the building. I also didn't see any photos that showed the east west of how long the building is. Um, and so I'm going to request we do have a video um, where we built a model that shows the actual scale and what that is compared to the neighborhood. And I would request that we play that video when I get done speaking. Um, I also wanted to engage in that um, attorney Donahue mentioned that, you know, the homeowners bought property here, assuming that they know that this could happen. But um, that's actually something that I really want to bring to the board's attention because 
Um, they mentioned buildings that were there that were larger, but were those ones built before the 4,000 square foot limit? And secondly, um, the fact that these homeowners bought there and they were near a commercial zone does not make them complicit in wanting an almost 10,000 square foot store. Um, they know that by right, there could be a 4,000 square foot store there. And no one is actually debating that. If um, the applicant would like to build a 4,000 square foot store, then they're welcome to. Um, they just have to, you know, pass the site plan review process, which they also have not done. So um, I guess what I'm getting at is that I think it's very inaccurate to put the blame on these abutters that have legal standing in this matter, because that's actually not the case. They know there could be a 4,000 square foot store, but they also know that that's not just allowed by right to have an almost 10,000 square foot store. So I think it's very clear here that there are many many detriments that do not outweigh the benefits. And that is really what this board is, is tasked to look at. And so um, I know that the applicant's job is to illustrate that they have many benefits. And I do appreciate some of the things that they, they brought to um, you know, demonstrate that. But at the same time, um, there's no reason why they can't do that for 4,000 square feet. So I would definitely urge the board to take those detriments, including the traffic safety and the wetlands into consideration. And I just wanna say that without having all this information in front of the board, such as an RDA, I don't see how the board can accurately determine whether or not there are more detriments, whether or not there are more detriments or more benefits. So I think it's important to gather all the information and I would also request a continuation and for us to have an opportunity um, to uh, address more of this information. And so could we please um, see that video that was sent in by Sue Half, the abutter? And I would, I'd be happy to speak uh, about what this video me, is showing. Excuse me, your time is up. Your time is up and we're not gonna show the video. You've had uh, six minutes. Uh, next person, please. Uh, could could uh, Mr. Sadowski, I'd like to see the video. Uh, have you recognized? Yes, you may. John Staborski. Uh, you know, because one of the things I requested at the last hearing, is, and because I, I initially requested and it went to a board vote, that I wanted to see how this building related in terms of scale to uh, the other buildings around the neighborhood. That was one of the characteristics, uh, one of the criteria we have to uh, consider. And I believe it was represented that it was too expensive and they didn't want to do that, but that they would do a 3D rendering of how this building would fit in with the, with the neighborhood. And, uh, and we didn't get that. And I'm wondering if I, my, my memory's accurate and, and if it wasn't done, why wasn't it done? Because I think it was represented it, it was going to be. Okay, my response is this video was on, was sent to the town office, correct? And it was presented because yes. I looked at it. Yeah, it's on uh, our website. Right. So it was there, John. But um, I did anyone else, did any, any other board member see this rendering? Yes, I was able to view it. Right. Mr. Oh. Decker? No, I haven't. You haven't seen it. Um, Mr. Potter? Yes, I've seen it. Mr. Uh, uh, Hirsch Rotter, Hirsch uh, no, <laughs> no I, I didn't see it. Okay, so since, since that's the case, uh, it was available, however, I think, then if you we have a, more of the members who have not seen it than have seen it, then I think we can play it then, since you've asked for it. Well, well Mr. Chairman, uh, if we take another recess, they can just click over to the town website and view it. Okay, good point. But, you know. you know, but for just as a point of information, I think if somebody wants to submit evidence, we need to take it. I mean, that's an important thing for us to do. And if somebody wants to present a paperwork or, or, or a video, that is something that we are obligated to accept. Well, we, it was presented. It was presented and the board members had a chance to look at it. I got it on my email. So it was out there. It was out there. So if Mr. you're saying Chairman? that, now we have to read everyone's comments. Uh, we will look at it again, but your point is taken, well taken. Uh, any other comments? Mr. Chairman, it's Adam Costa. Yes. So just to, to, to sort of echo the point of order, um, you know, I appreciate that with a project of, of this uh, size and scope, 
um, with uh, as much interest as there is uh, uh, public interest concerning the project, that there's, there's much information out there. there. There's information in all sorts of forums. Uh, you may receive information via email. Information may be submitted physically these days due to, due to COVID-19 restrictions. Information might be submitted by email. Uh, I say that for purposes of the administrative record, in other words, the sorts of things that the board will be relying upon, basing a decision on, to the extent that they're within the board's purview, there is a difference between something being available in town hall or being available on the website submitted as part of the public hearing. If it is something that whether the applicant wants to make the submittal or members of the public wish to make the submittal, if it's something that there is a desire to submit as part of the record of proceedings such that it becomes part of that administrative record, I think it's, it's critical that the board allow that to occur. Now, I recognize that these are unusual times and that none of us had anticipated that our next meeting back in January or February would be in August or would be via Zoom. Um, I'm not suggesting that you're absolutely obligated to accept um, a lengthy via, uh, video or other information through the Zoom format, particularly if it's not um, reasonable to submit it on the spot. Um, and that's not a problem if you intend to continue the public hearing and there will be some future opportunity to do that. Um, but I, I, I do want to provide very clear advice here that to the extent there's a request by a member of the public to submit something, um, I, I think that the board should honor that request, whether it be tonight or at some future time or day prior to the close of the public hearing. Well, I think I said that we were going to look at it. Okay, is that what I said? I, uh, Mr. Sadowski, looking yes. at it and having it be part of the record are two different things. And, and if we're trying to protect ourselves from being sued by somebody, one of the ways to get sued is not to accept evidence that they want to print for us. No, so it's me, really important for us to accept this. No, let me make it clear. I said we're going to look at it. That's not the same thing. We're going to show. I said we're going to we're going to see it now on that is the thing. video. We're going to see it on the video. What I meant was that we're going to look at this since we had members that didn't see it. I think that we can perfectly look at it. However, I do ask that board members, when they get things, please look this stuff over so that we're prepared when the meeting starts to have looked at this to make a proper decision. Uh, I get concerned when we're making decisions with stuff thrown at, at us at last minute. And that can be a problem. I, it's been a problem before and it continues to be a problem. However, I agree. We're gonna, we're gonna see the video, we're gonna present it, and we'll go from there, okay? Jen? Okay, I will do it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, what yes. are we gonna break again? Mr. Mr. Decker. When are we gonna break again? After this video, we'll take a break after, how does that sound? Are you buying pizza or not? No, I'm using a bathroom break and I will need one badly. So uh, please show the video, we're gonna take a break. Okay. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. That is at 4,000 square feet right there. And that is what the applicant's proposing. That is the largest of the condominiums directly abutting this proposed project. Okay, thank you. Okay, I propose a, what time is there? Um, 7.30 be all right with everybody? Mr. Decker, 7.30? That'll, that'll be fine. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski, Mr. Sokolowski, five, 
uh, 7.30 be all right? Mr. Tabersky. You know, I quite frankly don't think we need 23 minutes. Okay, that's why I'm asking. I, I, you know, if it's about, I'd like to keep this moving, and I'm thinking maybe a 15-minute break would be about enough. I hope that's enough time for everybody to take care of their business. Yeah, 725 works for me. Okay. Sure. Let's uh, do Mr. That. Potter, Alex? Yes. All yep, right. Sounds good. We'll reconvene at 725. Okay. Where's Jennifer? I'm right here. Okay, so we're all set to go. 725, open it back up. I think all our members are here. Yeah, um, I want to, uh, I'm able to now share Lily's picture if you will allow it because she wants to say okay, something yeah. next. Go ahead and show it now. Well, should we wait till we get back on? Well, yeah, everybody? wait till everyone's back on, please. Okay. I muted myself. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I got pizza coming, so if you want a slice later. Okay. 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 Anybody else who's in the building? Okay. Uh, Jen, I think what we'll do is these videos, if there's going to be any more, we're going to wait till we're all done with the discussion. I think that's only fair to people. There isn't any other videos. There's just that picture that um, Lily wanted to share. Okay. Okay. As far as I know. We have um, four hands up, just so you know. Okay. I also want to tell you, Bernie and other board members, that the whole chat I can put up for review afterwards so um, you can see all the questions that were asked. Um. Mr. Chair, I have a yes. Mr. Costa. Mr. Costa. Yes. Can you just explain that most of the board members are here? Uh, what this process is um, moving forward, the procedurally, so the chair and everybody that wants to be to know if you know procedurally what our options are to either continue or close the public hearing or, or et cetera. So, um, so through you, Mr. Chairman, I can certainly do that, but I can't do that until if, if the meeting has been recessed and the meeting has not yet been resumed, I'd be an open meeting law violation to have that conversation. So as soon as we hit 725 and the meeting's reopened, I can have that conversation. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. John, are you there? Uh, I am here. I'm okay. Here. I want to apologize. I thought everyone got that video and I uh, found out that that's not true. So I apologize for kind of getting on your case for um, the video because obviously no, not everyone got it. No, nope, I did not. And I, I'm going to make sure that when I go in that office that everybody gets the information because it's, we, we need to have information when we make decisions. And if people aren't getting it, that's not good. That's not good. And Bernie, let me tell you something else. Nobody, the only information that I knew that was at the town hall was in a green folder that was in the vestibule by the police uh, table. I right. went and viewed that today. Nobody told me anything else about there being a Dropbox or any other sort a source for information for board members to review. I thought it was only that file and I did that. And today I've learned that there is other information that is available for review. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, Jen, question. 
Comment. Yes, um, I just want to say to John, um, everything that was given to us, uh, we had put on our website and I made a special page to view it. And I apologize if, um, you know, we didn't get that to all of you. Sue had printed out every document and left it in the foyer. Um, and we just put the electronics, you know, ones on our website and they're all there. I made a separate page just for Dollar General and all of their details. Okay, I'm sorry. We're, we're not in violation here, Mr. Costa, are we? Discussing business? Um, I, the, the, hearing, the hearing hasn't been opened. I think it was, a, it was more of a question of procedure and okay. Okay. substance, but it, it is 725, so the Okay, we're gonna start. Uh, it's 725, actually 726. We're gonna open the uh, meeting back up for, um, we have some more comments, Jen. So, Mr. Chairman, yes. I got a I got yeah. a question um, before we get underway from uh, Mr. Sikalski uh, concerning this issue of you know what what is the what is the charge the board's charge and what are okay. the process? Would you like me to address that briefly? Um, would you like him to do it now, Adam? Uh, yes, members are giving a nod. They want to hear it now, please. Okay. So, Mr. Um, Mr. a simple Costa. version. Then, yes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'll, I'll give a, a simple or a condensed version of the board's charge. And then obviously uh, par part of the rationale for my participation in the process is to assist the board as it unfolds. Um, so you've got a public hearing that's underway and the public hearing is underway on an application for a special permit for use. And so as I had alluded to at the start of the meeting, you have a specific section of your zoning bylaw that is dedicated to special permits, section 5300. And specifically, uh, section 5320 is, is entitled criteria. And what section 5320 says, I've got it in front of me, so I'm just gonna read it verbatim because it's relatively self-explanatory. It, it indicates that special permits may be granted by the special permit granting authority, which in this case is the Zoning Board of Appeals, on a written determination that the benefits of the proposed use outweigh its debt impacts on the town and the neighborhood in view of the characteristics of the site and the proposal in relation to that site. That's the sort of overarching uh, general standard that gets applied. Now the, the bylaw goes on to say that in addition to any criteria that are set forth in specific provisions of the bylaw, that the determination that I just referenced, that the concept of do the benefits of the proposed use outweigh the detrimental impacts to the town and the neighborhood. In making that determination, the board should consider, shall consider, in fact it says, uh, six different items. And that's the six part test that we were referencing before. Social, economic, and community needs is the first part. Traffic flow and safety, including parking and loading is the second. Adequacy of utilities and other public services is the third. Neighborhood character and social structures is the fourth. Impacts on the natural environment is the fifth. And then potential fiscal impact, including impacts on town services, the tax base and employment is the sixth. And you've heard these before, not only because I had alluded to them, but because the applicants council had referenced uh, at least four, maybe five of those in its presentation earlier tonight. So substantively, that is the task that the board must perform. The board must apply those six criteria and make a determination based upon those criteria as to whether the benefits of the proposed use outweigh the detrimental impacts of the use on the town and the neighborhood. And in doing so, you can consider uh, the testimony that's been presented both by the applicant and by uh, residents and, and members of the public. You can consider the formal submittals that have been made, plans and other documents. Um, there are certain things that you shouldn't consider that shouldn't play a role in the outcome. Uh, neighborhood opposition shouldn't be in and of itself a basis for denial of a special permit. And of course, conversely, a, an applicant who uh, is, is a strong advocate for its project, um, that advocacy in and of itself isn't a basis for grant of the permit. It should be based on the specific criteria that I referenced 
and, and, and the application of those criteria to the project that is, is before the board. Um, there's, a, there's a tendency in my experience, and um, it, it, I, don't, I don't blame zoning boards for this because you have a lot of information that's submitted to you, but there's a tendency with a project that requires multiple permits and approvals. Maybe not just a special permit from the zoning board, but a site plan review from the planning board and maybe an order of conditions from the conservation commission. And even as we've heard tonight in, in this instance, uh, permits that aren't even issued locally, but permits that are issued by the state, there's a tendency to want to maybe consider that as part of the analysis. And there's a fine line there because I think that to some extent there is an overlap. To some extent, the uh, potential approvals, forthcoming approvals or denials of other boards and commissions, committees, departments, the state um, could have an impact on the decision-making process of the Zoning Board of Appeals. At the same time, it's generally the applicant that determines the sequence at which it seeks to obtain permits and approvals. And so I think the board needs to be mindful on the one hand to, you know, for lack of a better phrase, and I know it sounds harsh, but to sort of stay in its lane and, and look at what's before it and the task that, that uh, it is empowered with under the zoning bylaw. But also I think there is the right to recognize that there are other aspects of the project that will be reviewed by other, other bodies. And to the extent that that review plays into the analysis affects the six criteria and the determination that this board issues, then certainly you have the right to, to consider those, those same, uh, same characteristics of the project. So that's the substance of what you've got to do. The procedure is pretty simple. Much of it's already underway. There's an application made, there's a public hearing that's noticed. The public hearing is now underway. That public hearing can remain open for so long as you think it needs to, so long as you're gathering new information that is relevant to those six criteria. But once you feel that you have the adequate information you need to make a decision, well then typically the public hearing is closed. The board deliberates, discusses amongst itself without any further input from the applicant or from members of the public, deliberates on the six criteria and the, the general overarching uh, analysis that it needs to perform, um, and then renders a decision, crafts that decision, files that decision with the town clerk. And then of course, there are appellate rights that follow. The, the uh, applicant can appeal a, an adverse decision um, and the, 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 the residents, the neighbors, the public ha have the ability to appeal uh, uh, an approval. Um, so that's the, that's the procedural aspect of, uh, of this process. I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, so I assume by what you said that we need to look at each one of these six criteria, one by one. Well, certainly I think that, um, Mr. Chairman, that when you move into the deliberation phase, the expectation and certainly my recommendation as your counsel is going to be that when you craft a decision, um, especially because of what the case law says, especially if it's an approval, um, because if it's an approval, you have to find that each and every one of these criteria are satisfied. If it's a denial, you have to find that at least one of them is not satisfied. I'm going to recommend that you make specific findings. So part of that deliberative process will be walking through one, two, three, four, five, six, and getting the general consensus of the board as to whether each criterion has been satisfied or not. That doesn't necessarily mean that as part of the public hearing, you need to break it down to that level of detail. As long as you're gathering enough information through testimony, through documents, through feedback from the public, enough information that you'll be prepared once you close the hearing and you move into that deliberation phase, you'll be prepared and informed enough to make decisions on each of the criteria. Okay, let's go back again. So we have to have enough to, uh, when we, we go through this, to meet all these criteria. And then if we don't, we have to list the reasons that we are not, that are not being met. Is that correct? So you're required to make findings of fact. So if you, if you consider yourselves, you know, much like any other tribunal, like a court of law, when a court renders a decision on a case that's before it, the court finds the facts or a jury finds the facts and there are findings of fact that are often reduced to writing. And then based upon those facts, there are conclusions that are drawn. And so decision ought to be the same way. You will make findings of fact with respect to each of the criteria. Um, you will make findings of fact, for example, as to whether or not, um, as to traffic flow and safety generally, what, how, what traffic will this project generate? Um, is, is there, how, how will the traffic circulate through the site? How will uh, the traffic on adjacent roadways be affected by the addition of the project? 
you will make findings as to the adequacy of utilities. Are there utilities already available on the site? Or will new utilities be brought to the site? And are those utilities available? And then based upon those findings, you will have to weigh all that evidence, all that information, and say, okay, do the benefits of the proposed use outweigh the, 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 the detrimental impacts to the town and to the neighborhood? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then it's an approval. If the answer is no, then it's a denial. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't want to belabor this point. Do we have anyone else that has a question? I, I got a general idea. What we'll, do. we'll go into more detail when we go into deliberation. Oh, Mr. I, Zabersky, I think you have a question. Yeah, I do. Uh, there, there's one aspect of our zoning bylaw that I, I think, uh, you know, hasn't really been discussed, but is the social structure. One is neighborhood character and social structures. Uh, could, could you help us uh, understand what does the social structure clause mean? What are we looking at when we're trying to, I'm trying to, I would like to get a definition as if we take in these facts to be able to make a decision, is this affecting a social structure? So I, it's kind of a amorphous term. Sure, so so through you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, so again, Adam Costa, a council yep. for the board. Um, so so this, this sort of six part test or, or, or these criteria are criteria, and, and I had alluded to this before, that are found in many zoning bylaws and ordinances throughout Massachusetts. And similar language is used in many of them. And so this phrase is something that we see often, this concept of neighborhood character and social structures. And I'm not aware um, in, in most bylaws, I can't even think of a bylaw that ex explicitly defines social structure. I'm also not aware of any case law that specifically defines that exact term or phrase. Um, I can tell you that in discussing it with boards and in you know, obviously being familiar with the application of these standards on behalf of boards I represented from time to time representing private applicants before them, I think social structure is meant to expand upon the, 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 the more narrow concept of neighborhood character. And in fact, it is lumped together as part of that same criterion. So when you think neighborhood character, uh, you think about um, the, the sense and the feeling of the neighborhood that, uh, in which the, the locus or the subject property is located. And that in and of itself has been the subject of some litigation. What is the quote unquote neighborhood, something that counsel for the applicant already alluded to a bit in the presentation tonight. How do you define the neighborhood? Is it the immediately adjacent properties? Is it um, the, the corridor along which the site is located? Is it everything within a half mile or a mile or two miles of the site? What is the neighborhood? So there's no easy answer to that question. It, it may be different in each circumstance, depending upon the manner of settlement of a community um, and where the specific locus or, or subject property is located. And I think, think that with respect to social structure, you know, the idea is the same, that it's the structure of the community, not necessarily the aesthetic per se of the neighborhood, the character of the neighborhood, but you know, how, the, how the community has been developed, um, the, the manner in which different segments of the community are tied together and whether somehow, some way, this particular project you know, disrupts that and disrupts it in such a substantial way that its detrimental impact would outweigh any benefit that it might provide to the community. And I know that's not a you know, black and white simple answer to the question. Again, I'm not sure that there is one, um, but I think it's meant to sort of expand upon the narrower concept of neighborhood character simply so that you're not saying, well, you know, uh, the, 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 the dollar general proposal, this particular building doesn't look like the residence is next door to it. That's enough application denied. I think it's meant to, to, to be broader than that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else comments? Okay, let's go back to uh, public comments. Jen. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, oops, yeah, I'm gonna share. Lily's gonna say again, but I want to share my screen with the picture first. I'm gonna get it up. No. No, I said I'm getting it up. Sorry, I just oh, have I'm to make sorry. it bigger. Okay, so um, I'm gonna share. Okay, and now I will go and so everybody sees this picture. So now I'm going to um, remove it and then I can add um, her to speak one moment. Okay, Lily, you're on. 
Thank you. Hey, first I want to apologize to the board. My comment on gaslighting was actually directed to the applicants who were ignoring Mr. Staberski's question and denying Mr. Hayes's personal observations through obfuscation and misdirection. And I felt that they were gaslighting the board and the public. That was, I have nothing but the greatest appreciation for the work you all do and your staff, and especially trying to get this done. So I wanna be very clear on that. And I thank you all and I really appreciate it. I want to uh, talk about two dimensions here. The first one is that the data show that when a Dollar General moves into a town, local merchants lose 30% of their revenues. Now, on normal times, this was pretty catastrophic, especially for places that are like markets because they have a very narrow margin. But during the pandemic, this will lead to uh, closed buildings in our downtown. It will not be a benefit at all to our community. The other thing I want to point out is that the New Yorker ran a very interesting article on um, crime associated with dollar stores. And I'm just going to read it really quickly. The Gun Violence Archive, a website that uses local news reports and law enforcement sources to tally crimes involving firearms, lists more than 200 violent incidents involving guns at Family Dollar or Dollar General stores since the start of 2017, nearly 50 of which result in deaths. The incidents include carjackings in the parking lot, drug deals gone bad, and altercations inside stores. But a large number involved armed robberies in which workers or customers have been shot. Since the beginning of 2017, employees have been wounded in shootings or pistol whippings in at least 31 robberies and at least seven other incidents, employees have been killed. And uh, the point of that is that it goes on to say that in their annual report, the uh, big wigs were saying, well, we're gonna have to start cutting back on employees because we're losing our margins. And they're talking about having um, self-checkout because they won't pay for security. And so it, it, it's quite an interesting article and I'm, I'm happy to submit a link to it if, um, if the board would find that of interest. But I strongly urge you that, that this is not good for our community in any way, shape or form and will lead to the loss of our neighbors' livelihoods. Thank you. Yeah, what, I, we'd like to see it. Turn the information in, please, so we can look at it. You got um, it. Comments by the board members? Uh, may I, Mr. Sadowski? Yes. One question. You mentioned also <laughs> that there was data on how Dollar General affects uh, local businesses. If you know where that source of data, if you could supply it to the board so Certainly. we could do it. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. All right, Mr. Donahue. I would urge the board strongly to be very cautious in trying, trying to become, become specific as to a particular tenant and user of a building that's being built, particularly in this test of the charmer, is the size of the building. This cannot become a referendum on Dollar General versus some other retail user. It's inappropriate to, to go down that road. Mr. Donahue, you're- We can't um, hear, we can't yeah, hear you. Yeah. You're garbled. Yeah. You're, no. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yes, Mr. Costa. Uh, thank you, Adam Costa, uh, Town Council. So if I could be recognized for just a moment and- yeah. Um, certainly, you can allow Mr. Uh, Attorney Donahue to speak if, if he's able to resolve the, the, the issue with the, um, the audio. But I, I think the, the point that he was beginning to make, and um, I, I, will, I will echo the comment because it, it is of some concern to me too. Um, I certainly appreciate and, and I, I recognize every, every member of the public's First Amendment right to speak as they so choose about any sort of facility that is proposed for their community. Um, I also to get back to a point I made a short while ago, I also recognize the task that is before the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is the application of those six criteria that I referenced and a weighing of detriment 
in the context of those six criteria and other purposes for which the zoning power may be exercised. Cases in Massachusetts are quite specific about one thing, and that is the character or the reputation of an applicant, a particular applicant, whether it's an individual applicant, someone known in your community, maybe not the best of developers or the best of builders, or it's a company from outside your community that maybe, um, according to some, might have a less than stellar reputation. That is not something that is before the zoning board. So if you've got concerns about traffic safety, um, if you've got concerns about uh, consistency with neighborhood character um, because of the nature of the project, well, those are potential justifications for a denial or a conditioning of a project. The, the fact that you're dissatisfied with the, the concept of a quote unquote dollar general versus some other retail establishment would not be a sort of justification for denial that in my opinion would be upheld in, in a court of law if you were to use that as a, again, as a basis for, for a denial. So I, I, would, I would again um, caution the board to be mindful of that as you move forward and you deliberate on this project. Okay, back to Mr. Donahue. How are you doing now, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, certainly doing better than the right, better right, right side. Side. You're, You're not, right. not clear. Okay. I will, I will, um, I will, I will log, log out, out and, and uh, re-log in. Again. Again. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sadowski, could I? Yes, Mr. Staversky. Mr. Mr. Costa, or Attorney Costa, could I ask, uh, with respect to the question I asked, if there was data that there was going to be a negative economic effect on other businesses in Deerfield, um, is that something that, if there's data out there on this particular store for us to consider that data? Because I, I, I'm looking at one of the criteria is social, economic, and community needs. Does that fall within economic or does it not? So I, I, th I think the answer, I'm gonna give uh, an attorney a, an attorney answer, which is, you know, the answer is both yes and no. Um, so it, it sort of depends. Um, I would tell you this, I would tell you that if the data that you receive indicates that because of the business model of a dollar general store, or because of the price point of the, um, of, of sales of items of, of inventory at a dollar general store uh, that that will somehow have an effect on local businesses. I would be equally concerned um, about relying upon that sort of data as a basis for uh, denial or severe conditioning of an approval. However, there's another side to it. Um, if you're being asked and by you, I mean the board, the board is being asked to issue a special permit for uh, a, a project based upon the size of the retail operation. Um, you saw a presentation showing that this is significantly larger than what could be built, uh, quote unquote, as of right on the site. So if it has something to do with the size that adding a retail establishment that is so much larger than other retail establishments in the community might have an economic effect, a fiscal effect on the community, well, that's something that would be more in your wheelhouse and more an appropriate concept or, or, or topic for consideration than, again, singling out Dollar General, the business model associated with do Dollar General, the reputation of Dollar General, um, incidents of violence linked to Dollar General. Whenever you begin to use the name Dollar General, I get concerned because in my mind, as a zoning attorney, I'm looking at this as an application for a X thousand square foot retail establishment. That's what's before you. So we need to look at the data to, be, to evaluate whether it is with, uh, if we can consider it without peril. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tabriski. Mr. Donahue, are you ready to go again? I hope so. Okay. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> Shucks. I thought I was gonna get to watch the Bruins. Um, uh, let, let me, while I have the floor, if I might, uh, respond, because I didn't have a chance, because um, we went to break um, right after the video uh, of this purported uh, model that was shown. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure exactly what it was. All I could tell is from a movie screen set, it looked similar to, to a Godzilla setup. Uh, what I do know is precisely uh, the um, comparison of the land area of our lot and the building. And I've already provided that, but just to remind the board, 
The building has 9,319 square feet. The site's approximately two acres or 86,589 square feet. So the building itself takes up less than 11% of the site. I don't think that's a fair representation. That's what the, the video necessarily showed. I don't want to get into uh, a debate because I think it's just uh, going down a rabbit hole that doesn't take us any closer to it, but I didn't want the record to reflect. Thank you. Thank you. May I comment, Mr. Slavowski? Yes, Mrs. Stavarsky. Uh, Mr. Donahue, that's why I had requested at the last uh, meeting is to have a, uh, a 3D kind of computer generated rendering where you can look at the building relative to others. I mean, I've done that in my business and it's not expensive compared to what, what other monies you're spending on this project to show us how it sits on the site, how it relates to the other buildings in the neighborhood. Um, you know, for better, or for worse, I don't know how it turned out, but you almost have to look at it that way. And I think it'd be very helpful for the board to have something like that. If I might, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman, go, uh, uh, Mr. Dunny, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mark Dunny on behalf of the applicant. Uh, well, two things, I, I think the renderings that we've provided and have been committed to be further provided to the board at the anticipated continuance of this hearing uh, more, are more than adequate to achieve that goal. Uh, we have gone back and looked at other projects in the town uh, that uh, this board has had to deal with. Uh, we find no record uh, in the recent past of any uh, applicant, even in more congested areas, providing 3D modeling uh, of their site. Uh, so we don't believe it's either necessary for the board's determination, nor it's consistent with the board's practice. Thank you. I'm a new member. Uh, Mr. Staberski, uh, I, I have a I have a comment. Yeah, I happen to be a new member of this board, and uh, it's uh, consistent with my practice in looking at things. So. Uh, it might not have been the board's practice, but it's been mine. So that, uh, that, that's what I have to say about my, my request. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jen, are we set for the next uh, yes. Uh, comment? So, yes. So we have Lori Bashada. Lori? Hi. So I do want to thank the board for all of this exhaustive examination of all the issues here. Um, I prepared a spreadsheet, I think it was about two years ago, um, when this first came before us to look at specifically this word of community needs. So whether whatever kind of store it is, a store of that size, a retail store of that size, would as um, one of the um, uh, the developer, um, I don't, sorry, I don't have your name at my fingertips, pointed out that the, a store of the 4,000 square foot as in our zoning bylaws, as was voted and approved by our town meeting, um, a store of that size would not be adequate to make it financially viable, which strongly suggests that um, a store of that size would be occupied by a large out of town corporation that was uh, working on undercutting the prices of the local people. I'd also like to throw in um, on the social structures and um, let's see, the natural environment, impact on employment. Um, the, I think that we would all agree that our town, the pride of our town, certainly for me, is our agricultural history and are, as we know, farmers can only exist if they have a market. And I think a pride of our community is the farm stands that we have around here. So on that spreadsheet, um, so I would like to continue to support the social structures that keep um, those farmers in business. And on the spreadsheet that I prepared, all of the retail establishments in this town, with the exception of Leader Home Center, and I think their square footage includes their outdoor space, and Yankee Candle, which is a, a huge exception, they are all in the 4,000, just over um, 5,000 square foot range, including the new Cumberland Farms, which is 4,786 square feet. So the size of this retail establishment does not fit in to the social structures that we have established in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comments by board members? Anyone? Okay. Uh, Jen, move on, please. 
do you want to, um, I can put this spreadsheet up on the website, but Lori sent it to my email. Did you want to see it? Uh, board members want to see these, the spreadsheet or you want to look at it too? Uh, I see one yes. We should take it in as evidence and then. Okay, let's take it in as evidence then. Go okay. ahead. Jen, can I just say that it was, uh, you know, it's not formal. It was informal um, study that I did. And we could take out Dollar General to make it official and put in um, store, you know, 9,000 square foot retail establishment. And I think I had 50 seconds left. So I just want to add yes, that go ahead. A, lo a lot of money has been put into supporting the farms in this area from the Franklin Land Trust, from the community involved in supporting agriculture, from the Frank Franklin County Community Development Corporation. And I think our loyalty um, and our heritage is to our agricultural component here in the community. And I, again, just want to say that all of the people who are in front of us from um, Liscotti are being paid high, big bucks. So we don't have to worry about taking up their time. Um, they're getting paid to do this. So thank you for your work, um, Zoning Board. It's a pretty good looking spreadsheet to me. I think you did a pretty good job. Okay, next person, please. Okay, we have Alyssa Clement. Alyssa? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, Alyssa Clement, um, legal abutter to the proposal, Evans Lane. Thank you so much to the board for your time and work on this. Um, I, I have new material here to, um, to share to, that's on the detriments versus benefits to our community of any retail space of this size. And I'd like to speak to the detrimental effect of um, a, a retail space of this size to um, specifically the number four on that list read by Adam Costa of a neighborhood character and social structure um, and how an oversized development would affect that. Um, so the applicant speaks as if this is on Route 5 and part of that neighborhood in a sense. Um, to be clear, this property is on Mill Village Road, not on the Route 5 corridor, and the state land that is on Route 5 that contained yeah. the mature trees appears um, to be 115.9 feet wide, according to a map yeah. that I just linked to um, from the town website. So that's what I'm seeing as far as the size of that. In addition, we'd have no reason to expect a business of this size and character that does not meet the town bylaws that ever have been built there when we moved here. We bought a home adjacent to farmland and character with this quiet New England town. Living in a neighborhood of this character is important because we have a child with sensory processing disorder. Our peaceful yard is the place that provides my child with critical relief from sensory processing disorder and sensory overloads. Unlike a store like Atlas Farm Store, that's within the allowed size and character of our neighborhood, the oversized proposed store with all the extra noise, people, light, traffic, etc., a store of that size and character would bring would completely change the character of our neighborhood. If you grant the special permit, we will have to move to a new neighborhood of this character as a direct result of the detrimental change in character to our neighborhood this oversized development would bring. Um, and again, I would like to reiterate that it really, it's not reasonable to see if we should have expected that. Thank you so much for, for hearing us and for all the work you do. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, continue, Jen. Sorry, here I am. Um, we have Pat Ryan. Uh, good evening. This is Patricia Ryan. Uh, I live on Greenfield Road. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, I have never spoken at a public hearing before, although I have attended all of the hearings uh, on this issue. And I was actually quite proud at the January 23rd hearing um, to see all my neighbors testifying. It, Unlike tonight, when we had some people, especially abutters, unable to participate, 
Um, one in particular distresses me. I really wanted to hear Gina Cowley speak because she's the owner of the Rock Fossil Dinosaur Shop next door and her business will be imperiled. There is no doubt. She offers games for children and they play outside her establishment. And I'm really sorry that you haven't been able to hear her speak. Um, I and was also distressed to hear um, Attorney Donovan's unyielding comment about how they would not consider a smaller store. This is not about what we like or don't like. This is about size, size and safety. And I really um, didn't understand his adamant position on this. And, um, but again, I appreciate the board and I know you've got a hard road to hoe. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, uh, Jen. Okay, I have Lily Dwight. Hi, Lily Dwight, uh, 45 South Mill River Road once again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am just raising my hand because Gina is trying to speak, and I see in the chat. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention because she's in the butter, and I'm sure that you want to hear from her. She put, I would appreciate time to talk about the effects of building the size would affect on business, which is right next door to the building lot. So um, I don't know how we can do it, but I, I agree. And as Pat said, um, can, we've got to get Gina to be able to speak. Thank you. I can't see it. I don't know. Calling on a phone number or something. Hello. Is Jen? Are, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So can can you help Gina? Do you think to speak? So I uh, I posted on to Gina the call in number the okay. uh, everything I gave it I, in the chat. So. Yeah. Could you just maybe type the phone number right? Oh, she says she's on the call in number right now. So I will get off. I will okay. Bye. Okay. Okay. So it looks like we were just waiting for Gina's comment and there's no more hands raised. I did want to make a comment that I requested uh, from the, uh, Mark Donahue's the documents that he said that were submitted uh, an approval for the septic and I have posted them on our website. And there's three of them. So if you go to the red bar where I put all of the documents for this Dollar General, um, they're at the very bottom. So there's three documents there. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. And I don't see. Don't see her on Gina. Decker just disappeared. Is the four one three two zero four number is that Gina? Is that Gina? Yes. Okay. This is Gina, right? Oh. Yes, it is. Okay. You're on with the board. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Gina Bordoni Cowley, and I am the uh, owner, um, Anna Butter. Uh, of the the proposed um, 
development uh, at the lot that is right next door to uh, the Rock Fossil Dinosaur Shop. Um, so I, I just want to talk, I, I've mentioned this many times at various meetings and I've written letters, um, and, but I, I do want to talk about just sort of threading back to what Mr. Costa was uh, and many other members um, were highlighting and that is um, do the benefits of a building that size um, outweigh uh, the detriments and I can only speak for um, myself. I have uh, have this little small business and I um, feel like uh, a retail store of that magnitude um, in that lot size, um, in that neighborhood next to my tiny little family business um, and one that would disrupt the environmental ecosystem there really outweighs um, you know, what I'm thinking about here, I, I think that it would be extremely uh, detrimental to my business. Um, certainly, as I think Lily was pointing out, the economic effects of my tiny business next to uh, that Colossus would be affected. Um, also, I've had terrible flooding inside the shop, outside of the shop. Uh, once the trees were illegally uh, taken out. And I know that they've replaced the trees, but they're young trees. And so they're not able to absorb all of that flood water. And that little, uh, the little drain system that I have in the parking lot cannot handle all that water. So because of that, I've had a lot of damage inside the shop and then again, outside the shop. Now, also the, in terms of traffic safety, uh, it's, a, it's a small, family-oriented business uh, that Pat was beautifully talking about. Um, and that parking area, which would be right next door to the um, business, the retail business, is uh, a place where kids get in and out of their cars. I have school buses that come with kids. That's where they load and unload. So I'm very concerned about their safety, given that uh, there'll be a lot of in and out since they moved that driveway more north, which is closer to my parking lot. Um, and so their delivery trucks going to be entering and exiting that as well. Um, and then again, all of that runoff back into uh, that, that parking lot area of mine. So, you know, I feel like that video actually that Tolly sent was extremely important because it compares uh, that size of a building to the size of my shop and it basically dwarfs my shop so of course it's going to have detrimental effects on on my business absolutely um, it's going to overshadow things and cause a, a safety concern again an economic concern and an ecological concern as well Okay, thank you for your comments or questions by any board members. Okay, uh, Jen, do we have anybody else? There's nobody uh, left with hand raised. Okay. There are some comments in the chat and I don't know do, if you want me to read can them. The, can the board members see those comments? They should be able to. Okay. Does anyone have any comments on the um, any comments on the comments? I do, uh, you know, there's a lot there. Uh, and I'm wondering, since those are written comments, uh, should we give the applicant an opportunity to respond in writing to those? And we'll take the comments and the responses as, uh, as additional evidence. If the applicant is interested or willing to respond to the comments. Okay, Mr. Donahue. If, if uh, Mark Donahue, on behalf of the applicant, if, if the question is whether the applicant wants to go through the entirety of the thread of the chat uh, for the past four plus hours and respond to each one of those, we'll look at it. I have not been trying to stay in real time on that. Um, uh, and see if there's anything that requires a reply that we'll bring to what I assume will be our next meeting. 
Um, but I, I doubt that the applicant's gonna uh, justify or uh, honor uh, each and every comment with a reply. Mr. Yeah. Chair, may I speak? It's Jennifer Gannett. Yes, go ahead, Jen. I can, um, I can populate the entire chat into a document and send it to all of the board members and you know, post it on the website so people wanted to make comment. How does the board feel about that? Um, can I be recognized, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sikolowski. Well, first off, I just would like to say to all the people that have invested a lot of time and um, effort into their comments and presentations, it's all taken very well. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, public discord um, this project and I appreciate the time and effort that people made just to, to uh, watch these meetings or to participate. But um, as far as responding to the comments, I would like to see them. I've been keeping a good eye on them. So um, anything that's sent in is definitely taken to heart um, as we move this process forward. So if you can email those out, Jen, that's fine with me. Okay, can someone, can you still see me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, I moved something over here, and uh, there's I got a zoom on my on my um, uh, picture here. Uh, if we're done with discussion from people, uh, is everybody on the board comfortable with the uh, comments and time that we've had with the with the public? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Tversky. Yes, the only thing that I that we that the applicant is supposed to present some additional evidence and renderings to us uh, at a at a subsequent meeting and maybe respond to these. If we are going to have additional public comment, I think it I think it should be limited to the new material or or whatever is presented and not to uh, not to argue the same points again, but uh to maybe not stop not uh close evidence but limit the additional evidence to things that have not been addressed yet like some of the comments or the the drawings and things that the applicant said they were going to respond to okay anyone else any other thing mr chairman yes mr decker the other thing is we need to to ask the applicant to bring us up to date on all the other things that are in the mix, uh, the, the driveway permits, the road, and, and all, all of that stuff, so that hopefully the next meeting we have, we can close the hearing, and then we can either try to figure out what's happening and, and either issue a decision that night or, or put the decision off to another day but close the hearing and get all the stuff in because it's been going on for a year and a half. Nice time. I think it's a year and a half. Mr. Donahue, comments? No, we, I, we, we've got some homework to do. Um, we committed to provide some additional information. Uh, there were comments made that we didn't uh, exercise our rights, so that at least the public would be able to participate that we want to weigh in uh, with a reply probably in writing to the board that we'll submit before the next meeting as to some of the statements made particularly as to the traffic study and the like um so um i will we'll certainly be able to provide that i don't know what the board's thinking about for a term of a continuation um but we'll get it in before that so you'll have it we'll be prepared to continue to discuss it with the board and hear as much public comment as the board feels is necessary to render a decision on the special permit. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes, Mr. Decker. I think we're scheduled to have a meeting in September, uh, I, about a month from today. I'm not sure of the date. Correct. Well, we that, September 10th. September 10th. Does anybody have a problem with continuing the meeting to that night? We have some other things on the possibly on the agenda that night. Uh, do we want to start again at four o'clock, or what time would is going to be convenient? Because I know John's away, but if he's 
something else that night, uh, we can put it up. But I, I really like to get these things. Tonight's meeting, you weren't at the present last time, John, but we had two other hearings that we thought were going to be scheduled tonight that didn't get scheduled. The, the notices didn't go out. That's why we had the four o'clock start today, because we knew we had a lot of stuff to do. So, well, up to, up I, to the board. I can never make a four o'clock meeting. I just, it's impossible with my work. So, um, so you know, I'd have to resign from, from this board if there are four o'clock meetings. I just can't make them. Okay. Um, well, we're gonna, it looks like, Mr. Decker, we're going to have four the next time around. That's what I'm afraid of. We're going to have four. So if we started at four o'clock, we still won't be going until probably like we did tonight or this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I be recognized? Yes, Mr. Sokolowski. Well, I know four is a little bit early, but we got a lot accomplished tonight. Um, I don't know if Jen has the schedule on those other two, and, and I don't know you know, how much time, if we're not, if we're basically, we're keeping the hearing open just to have a response from the developer and then take in and accept any other written comment. We're not going to have any more verbal comment from the public. Um, I don't know how, you know, how long it's going to, it's going to take. And then we have to go, go possibly deliberate and then make a decision maybe in October, you know, maybe if uh, five or six works, for John, I mean, you know, I don't like to be here till 10 o'clock at night, but if we have to on, you know, one night a month with the meeting, I'd rather start earlier than go later. But um, I think we we need to make sure that Mr. Costa is available because um, that's, and Mr. Donahue, that kind of uh, messed us up in February before the whole COVID stuff. Hit. And then maybe in September, we might be able to get to be in person. I mean, if the kids are going back to school, we might might be able to do this in person so well interestingly we had only 48 attendees probably that i don't know if that included uh all the all of us but we were under the 50 person limit yeah. so we could, could have the 51st person to go on zoom or something <laughs> you know uh, this is jennifer gannett can i say something yeah, yeah. go ahead go ahead jen we don't want to take the risk of turning anybody away for the 50 person limit outside or how, you know, we're going to just like close it and send everybody home. Uh, and there's 25 inside town hall and with the pandemic, the way that it is, I mean, I, well, I don't think we want to risk it, but so this is what most of the state is doing successfully. And I, we've done a pretty good job for our first time, but um, I just, that's my comment. Thank you. Right. And do you have the schedule? What were the other two issues that were emailed out? Um, you know, are they, are those confirmed for the 10th? Uh, the uh, accessory apartment and then the steam mill road issue? Still water have, road and steam mill? I'd have to check with, uh, with Bob to see are they ready to go forward? I'd have to take a look. So there may be, I do have an application to review with Bob. Um, Bob, do you know? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I unmuted myself. Um, I would have to check with Sue. I mean, as far as I know, they are moving forward, but I can't confirm that without checking with her because she's scheduled for the zoning board. But to my knowledge, they're on the agenda. Um, but I, I, want, I don't want to say 100%. But if we started at four and we got through those, John Stabersky could probably get there at 530 and yep. we could get into the Dollar General. If he could get there earlier, we could we could take it. We'd just schedule them all starting at four and with the idea that we'd recess if needed to for John to get there for four, for 530. Because That's fine with me. That work? But, but Adam, I, I want to say something, a, a comment on something you said. If there, uh, although we're probably not going to re, we will not rehear the same thing from the public, but if it's pertaining to any new information that's been submitted or something that Mr. Donahue responds to, the public still has a right to comment on those matters. We can't close out that on still things that are under deliberation. No, I, I, I get that part, but it should be less than what we did tonight. We heard an awful lot tonight. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. So I'll yield my time back to Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Decker? I'd like to move that we continue the hearing on this applicant tonight till uh, September the 10th. Uh, and we would schedule it to be the last item that we would take up at that meeting uh, because we have two or three other things to probably do first, which would make it, uh, Mr. Staberski will be able to accommodate his schedule because we don't want to knock off a, a full board member uh, because there's only so many people that are eligible to vote because we're already down one board member. So could I could I um, move that uh, you amend it to start at 5.30? That the hearing starts at 5.30? For a Dollar General or for the others? For the Dollar General. Yeah, we could do that. That, that'd be fine, but we're gonna but we're gonna schedule the other meetings starting at four. Okay, so I do I have a motion to start at five thirty for Dollar General? Yes. Are you are a condition of uh, of our meetings that will Dollar General will start at five thirty and the other meetings will come before? And if we get them before, we'll recess until Mr. Staberski is available. Yeah, I think you ought to just keep it at five thirty. Just five thirty, yeah. Okay. For all of them. Okay, so do I have a second on that? I uh, second I'm confused. that. I think you need to re-clarify the motion. Okay, I'm sorry, you're right. Let me make a motion. Move that, that, that the next meeting commence at four o'clock and the dollar general matter be, be commence at 5.30. I'll second that motion. Adam Sokolowski for the second. Okay, uh, let's take a vote. Mr. Decker? Yes. Mr. Staberski? Yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. Uh, David Potter? Yes. Mr. Sokolowski? Yes. And I abstain. So those two people got a chance to vote. Okay, I'd like to make a comment to the public, if I could. Does the board have an objection to that? No. All right. I want the public to know that we wanted to hold this meeting outside. And I am a strong advocate for the First Amendment and everyone has a chance to speak. Now we did limit it because we have a time restraint and if we went on and went on and went on, we would, wouldn't, we wouldn't finish. So we wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance to speak. Believe me that the town spent a lot of time getting organized for us to be outside tonight. And in the last minute they were shut down. So they had a lot of work to do, not just the uh, sitting committee here but the people in the office, and they must be commended for the, getting this thing together. This is not an easy thing to do. And as you can see, I don't know half the time how to run these things. And I got a lot of support from people. And I want to thank them for being patient because this is really confusing. I mean, you did a great job and I want to thank them again. And I want to thank the board members for being tolerant of this. This is not an easy process and this does not make it easier. I would like to speak face to face to people. I think that's the way it should be done. However, we are not able to do that because of state laws. Am I correct, Mr. Costa? Correct, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Costa, that's am correct. I correct? We are limited in what we could do. Th that is correct. There are, there are still limitations under the various orders, governor's orders on indoor gatherings and there are also limitations on, on outdoor gatherings. As you had alluded to, the order that issued about a month and a half ago in early July for outdoor meetings had uh, capped those meetings at 100 persons. And we, uh, the town was fairly confident about a week and a half or a week ago that we could make that work and we're, we're beginning preparations for an outdoor meeting. And you know, literally the day after I had a conversation with staff to try and put the finishing touches on that, the governor amended his order and reduced the outdoor requirement um, for 50 people. And we were concerned that we would exceed 50 people, hence the, the uh, decision to do it by Zoom. Okay. So we don't know what'll, what'll happen between now and September 10th, but um, cool. I, I, would, I would be surprised if there are drastic movements in one direction or the other. Okay, but we could be outside by far uh, available to be in the town office, town hall, if, or this meeting room, correct? We could be. If possible. Yeah, okay. 
like again, I like to apologize to the public. It's been if it's been a difficult process for all of us, and the time we try to straighten this out, it, it I don't think anyone knows. And being chair, I've learned a lot. I, you know what I've learned? I learn I don't know as much as I think I know, and every time I come in, I learn less. So I apologize to the board members that uh, I've probably done some things I shouldn't be doing. Uh, I'm learning. Um, and I'm, I'm, thank, I'm thankful I have a good board that supports me and helps me in the direction I need to take because it's, it's not easy. It's easier to, to not be a chairman. I, I'm learning my lesson on this. It's, <laughs> my friends got to get together and stuck me in here. You know, like the guy gets elected, all his, his enemies got together and put him in office. Well, that's kind of how I feel. But thanks, board members, and thanks. Okay, let's get on with business. We have to... Um, Go on with chair. Jen. I have one more hands up. Are you still taking comment? No. 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 Um, no. We've already moved to, to continue the meeting until such and such a day. Okay. All right. Sorry, Chris. Christine. I mean, we can we can open it up if the ward wants to open it up. It's up well, to you. They, we can't no. Okay. We close the that. hearing unless it now has to do with if it has to do with something that uh, just general business, I think you're going to get on with the mail and such, right? Correct. We're on yeah. mail. I can find my papers. Okay. Uh, thank, oh. thank you to all for Mr. Donahue and every Mr. Kelly and, uh, and everyone else who came from, uh, from your group uh, for your patience. Glad, glad to help. But uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not so sure I heard a vote. I heard a, a motion a second, but I didn't hear oh. we, we did take a vote. It was unanimous that we're gonna have the, the meeting on the uh, 10th? Is that well, right, Bernie, Jen? Bernie, you might have might have been supposed to do a roll call vote. Okay. He did, he did do a roll call. He did. He did. I did. He did. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, September 10th with, at 5.30. With, with all due respect, if, if you took a roll call, I missed it, and I think Attorney Costa might have missed it, so. Okay, I will take it again then. Can help us sleep better by doing it again? Okay, uh, roll call vote. Mr. Decker? Yes. Mr. Stavarsky? Yes. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski? Yes. Mr. Alex? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Mr. Potter? Yes. And I abstained, so they all got votes. That's what I said the first time. That's so right. I okay. guess you guys must have missed it, but that's okay. And, and also, thank you, Ms. Donnie, and your people, and all the people that participated in this. This is not an easy process, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna do the best we can and you had some good pr presentations and you helped me out because I didn't have things right okay appreciate um, the boys consideration okay um, old business any old business any new business all right so do I have a, a, a I'm dead brain dead I motion to adjourn. <laughs> do I have a motion to adjourn I second. Okay, let's take a vote. Mr. Stavarsky. Yes. Roll. Yes. yes. Roll call vote. Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, Mr. Potter. Yes. Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. And Alex. Yes. And I abstain. Uh, meeting is closed and we'll convene again uh, October, no, September. September 10th. 10. 10. 4 p.m. All right. Thank you, Mr. Costa, for your help. Um, do you need to talk to me or are we all pretty well set? I think we're good. Nice job tonight. And, uh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I hope I'm more successful. Than I was in the class. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Have a nice night, everybody. Yeah. Okay,